For millennia, migration and settlement patterns in Ukraine's current borders have varied drastically based on geographical regions. Ukraine's mixed forest steppe and forest belt supported an agricultural population linked by waterways to northern and central Europe, which was sustained by the mixed forest steppe and forest belt of north-central Ukraine from the mid-5th to early 3rd millennia BCE. Military combat and cultural transmission were common in these marshlands. Beginning in the 7th century BC, many Greek colonies were founded on the coast of the Black Sea and on the Crimean Peninsula. These colonies came under the rule of the Roman Empire later on. The steppe hinterland was first inhabited by the Sumerians, Scythians, and Sarmatians during the first millennium BCE. These people, all of Iranian descent, maintained economic and cultural ties with the Greek colonies. About 200 CE, the Goths descended from the Baltic region into Ukraine, and a significant movement ensued. They were followed by the Huns from the east in the 5th-6th centuries by the Bulgars and Avars. The Ukrainian steppe was part of the Turkic. Khazar Empire from the 7th to 9th centuries. The Magyars broke through Khazar control of the steppe in the late 9th century. The Pechenegs followed, and they were in charge of much of southern Ukraine from the 10th to 12th centuries. They were replaced by the Polovsians in the 14th century. During the late antiquity and medieval periods, the Crimean Peninsula was subjected to a series of migratory invasions. Only a few Greek settlements managed to survive by relying on Byzantine aid. In the meantime, beginning in the 5th and 6th centuries, Slavic tribes migrated from their original territory north of the Carpathians as a result of Germanic invasions. The East Slavs lived in the forests and steppes of present-day western and northern Ukraine and southern Belarus, where they expanded north and northeast into areas that would come to form part of the future Russian state centered on Moscow. The East Slavs engaged in agriculture and animal husbandry, produced textiles and ceramics, and established fortifications, some of which became important commercial and political hubs. Kiev was one of the first settlements on the high right bank of the Dnieper River. The formation of the Kievan state, which began in the mid-9th century, the Varangian role in this process, and the term Rus by which this entity was known are all areas of contention among historians. This configuration, however, was connected to changes in international trade and the new prominence of the Dnieper route from the Baltic to Byzantium, on which Kiev was strategically located. Varangian merchant warriors dominated this route, and the Varangians are said to have given rise to the Kievan princes, who were soon slavicized. In early chronicles, the Varangians were known as Rus, and this collective name came to be applied to the Kiev region, the basic territory of the Rus. By the end of the 10th century, the Kievan realm spanned much of Ukraine north of Lake Ladoga and up to the upper Volga Basin. It did not have a central political structure, remaining a loose confederation of principalities that ruled over a dynastic clan business like other medieval states. The reigns of Volodymyr the Great, Vladimir I, and his son Yaroslav I in Kiev reached their zenith. In 988, Volodymyr Ur became a Christian and had all of Kiev baptized. Christianity and culture from Byzantium entered the orbit of Rus. The Metropolitan of Kiev was made the leader of a church hierarchy, which was headed by the Patriarch of Constantinople. With the advent of Christianity came new types of architecture, art, and music as well as a formal language, as well as nascent literary culture. Yaroslav actively promoted all of these. He also established a code of laws, the first in Slavdom, and aggressively marketed all of them. Despite his continued focus on Byzantium and the steppe in foreign policy, Yaroslav maintained amiable ties with European rulers, with whom he entered marital agreements for future generations. Kiev's fortunes declined after Yaroslav's death, only to be halted in the 12th century by Volodymyr II Monomak. While trade routes shifted, Kiev's economy diminished. Warfare with the Polovsians on the steppe drained its resources and vitality. The political ascendancy of Kiev was jeopardized by succession conflicts and princely rivalry. The rise of new centers and the clustering of principalities around them reflected regional differences, historical, economic, and tribal ethnic, that had persisted even during the era of Kiev's supremacy. These distinctions were exacerbated by the Mongol Tatar invasions. Novgorod and Moscow were two important areas that would eventually become part of Russia. Novgorod was to the north of Belarus and Moscow was in the northeast. In the southwestern corner of modern-day Ukraine, Galicia Volhynia rose to prominence as a major principality. The Galician city of Halic, on the Niester River, became a principality in the 12th century, and Volodymyr in Volhynia had been an important Kievan Rus' princely seat. 
In 1199, the two principalities were linked by Prince Roman Mstislavich to form a strong and wealthy nation that controlled portions of Kiev's domains. Galicia Volhynia reached its highest eminence under Roman's son Danilo. Numerous new towns were established, with Lviv, in Ukraine, being the most significant, trade, especially with Poland and Hungary, brought a lot of prosperity, and culture blossomed, with Western influences becoming more prevalent. Danilo, however, was rejected by the West in 1253 and accepted the royal crown from Pope Innocent IV, who recognized him as head of the church. Danilo's reign saw a lot of conflict. Noblemen fought each other, there were problems with Poland and Hungary, and the Mongol invasion happened. This all meant that Galicia Volhynia fell apart until 1340 when Romans' dynasty took control. Ukrainian lands were incorporated into three external empires by the end of the 14th century, the Golden Horde, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and Poland's kingdom. The steppe and Crimea were now part of the Venetian and Genoese empires. These coastal towns and maritime trade were vital for the Tatar Golden Horde. The Blue Horde was the westernmost descendant of Genghis Khan's Mongol Empire, whose ruler resided at Sarai on the Volga. By the mid-15th century, the Golden Horde had begun to collapse. The Crimean Khanate, which succeeded it in 1475, accepted the Ottoman Empire's suzerainty in 1475. The Khanate maintained authority over the Crimean Peninsula and vast swaths of adjacent steppe until its incorporation into the Russian Empire in 1783. Elsewhere in Ukraine, Mongol rule was not as direct. The local princes were in charge of tax and tribute collection. However, this period of Mongol rule was relatively short-lived. Northwestern and central Ukraine became the territory of a new power that had arisen in the 13th century, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. After incorporating all the land of Belarus and Lithuania, Grand Duke Algird has rapidly advanced into Ukraine. In the 1350s, Lithuania took Chernihiv and adjacent regions, as well as in the 1360s territories of Kiev and southward to Periaslav and Podolia, which it ruled until 1569. Lithuania and Poland went to war over the former Galician Volhynian Principality. The war ended with a partition in which Lithuania gained Volhynia and Poland was confirmed in its possession of Galicia. This gave Lithuania control over almost all of the Ukrainian lands, as far as the open steppe and even. The Ruthenian lands, which are located within the Grand Duchy, initially retained a lot of their autonomy. The pagan Lithuanians were gradually converting to orthodoxy and assimilating into Ruthenian culture. The Grand Duchy's administrative practices and legal system drew heavily on Slavic customs, and an official Ruthenian state language, also known as Rusyn, developed over time from the language used in Rus. Poland ruled over Ukraine for a short time in the 1340s and for two centuries after that. In Galicia, which is in western Ukraine, there were more changes in areas such as administration, law, and land tenure than there were in Ukrainian territories that were ruled by Lithuania. However, owing to the dynastic connection between the nations and the baptism of the Lithuanians into Christianity in 1385, Lithuania was quickly drawn into Poland's orbit. The spread of Catholicism among the Lithuanians caused the Polish language, culture, and political and social orders to also spread among the Lithuanian nobility. This made it harder for the Orthodox Ruthenians to keep their position. This had happened earlier in Galicia. In 1569, the dynastic link between Poland and Lithuania was changed into a constitutional union of the two countries as the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. At the same time, a lot of Ukrainian territories was taken away from Lithuania and given to Poland. This act made it easier for Ukrainians and Belarusians to become different from each other. The eastern Ukrainian lands were more closely integrated with Galicia. For the next century, all of the ethnically Ukrainian lands were impacted by Polish political and cultural dominance. Ukraine changed a lot during the three centuries when Lithuania and Poland ruled it. Families who were part of Kiev and Rus merged with the noble estate in Lithuania and Poland. Many Ruthenian nobles converted to Roman Catholicism in the late 16th century. This was often encouraged by education in Jesuit schools. The burghers became a prominent social class as towns and urban trades, particularly in western Ukraine, expanded. They were divided both on an internal social hierarchy linked to the guild system and religion and ethnicity. Many Poles, Armenians, Germans, and Jews had immigrated to the cities and towns by the 13th century, leaving Ukrainians as a minority in many places. Although the burghers came to play an influential role within the Ukrainian community, they were not treated equally because they were not Catholic. This meant that they progressively lost their ability to participate in the municipal self-government enjoyed by many cities and towns under Magdeburg law. 
the status of the peasantry took a nosedive during Polish rule. The free peasantry that had survived into the late Lithuanian period was rapidly enslaved, while serf obligations themselves became more stringent. Peasant revolts increased in frequency toward the end of the 16th century, especially in eastern Ukraine. For the first time, sparsely inhabited areas were open to Polish ownership, and huge latifundia were established through royal concessions to satisfy Europe's grain demands. Peasants were given temporary releases from serf obligations in order to attract labor to the new settlements. When these exemptions expired and servitude was reimposed on a people acclimated to liberty, there was a lot of dissatisfaction and peasant flight into the wild fields, the steppe regions to the east and south. Tensions were exacerbated by the fact that, while the peasants were Ukrainian and Orthodox, the landlords were mostly Polish, or Polonized, and Roman Catholic. As a result, social dissatisfaction tended to merge with national and religious prejudices. As the social circumstances of the Ukrainians in Lithuania and Poland deteriorated, so did the position of the Ruthenian Church. The Roman Catholic Church, which was steadily growing eastward into Ukraine, had state and legal authority over the Orthodox Church. Internal tensions and limits were matched by a severe internal decline in the Ruthenian Church throughout this period. Catholicism, revitalized by the Counter-Reformation and the arrival of Jesuits in Poland, as well as Protestantism, albeit temporarily, made considerable progress among the Ruthenian aristocracy from the mid-16th century onwards. In the final decades of the 16th century, efforts to restore the Ruthenian Church's fortunes gained momentum. At Ostro, Volhynia, in 1580, Prince Konstantin Ostrogsky established a cultural center that included an academy and a printing press and attracted some of the era's leading minds. Among its most significant accomplishments was the publication of the first comprehensive Slavonic Bible. Burgers in Lviv and other cities set up lay brotherhoods to help support churches, schools, and printing presses. They also did charitable work. However, the brotherhoods often had disagreements with the orthodox hierarchy over who should have authority over their institutions and how clergy should be reformed. In 1596, a synod in Brest led to a radical change in religious developments. The Kievan Metropolitan and the majority of bishops agreed to sign an act of union with Rome. This meant that the Ruthenian Church recognized papal primacy, but still kept the Eastern Rite and Slavonic liturgical language. This so-called Uniate Church was unsuccessful in gaining the same rights as the Latin Church. It also couldn't stop the process of Polonization and Latinization of the nobility. At the same time, the Union of brest litovsk caused a severe division in the Ruthenian Church and society. This was demonstrated by a large polemic literature, fights for eparchies and church properties after the restoration of an Orthodox hierarchy in 1620, and numerous acts of violence. Attempts to fix the breach in 1620s and 30s did not work. In the 15th century, a new martial society was beginning to form in Ukraine's southern steppe frontier. This society was called the Cossacks, and they were known for their adventurous spirit and freedom. The term Mongol was originally used to describe daring men who traveled across the steppe in the summertime to pursue game, fish, and collect honey. Peasants fleeing serfdom and adventurers from other social strata, including nobility, were constantly added to their ranks. The Cossacks had a military organization by the mid-16th century. This organization was peculiarly democratic, with a general assembly as the supreme authority and elected offices, including the commander-in-chief. Their center was an armed camp in the lands of the lower Dnieper River. People called this area Zaporozhye. The Cossacks were warriors who defended the people living near the Ukrainian frontier from Tatar attacks. They also conducted their own campaigns into Crimean territory and raided Turkish coastal cities in Anatolia. The Polish government thought that the Cossacks were a useful fighting force in wars with the Tatars, Turks, and Muscovites. However, in peacetime they viewed them as a dangerously volatile element. The introduction of a formal register to control them institutionally and limit their numbers provoked a great deal of resistance among the Cossacks, who felt they were fast emerging as a distinct estate with inherent rights and liberties. The Cossacks launched sporadic revolts over a half-century that were quelled only after considerable effort. In the first half of the 17th century, the Cossacks also got involved in a religious conflict. In 1620, the entire Zaporozhian host joined an Orthodox Brotherhood. A new Orthodox hierarchy was consecrated in Kyiv with their military protection. The Cossacks, therefore, became associated with Orthodoxy and adamant opposition to the Uniate Church in the Great Religious Divide. Orthodoxy thrived in Ukraine during Peter Mogola's leadership of a new metropolis of Kyiv, Ukrainian, 
Petro Mohyla, which resulted in a cultural rebirth that included the creation of the Kievan Mohyla Academy, Ukraine's first institution of higher learning. In 1648, simmering social discontent, religious conflict, and Cossack animosity toward Polish authority came to a head. Ukraine was swept up in an unprecedented war and revolution after beginning with a seemingly typical Cossack uprising led by Bodin Komernitsky. In the wake of a Polish atrocity, Khan Komernitsky was a minor nobleman and Cossack officer who fled to the sick in late 1647 and was elected hetman. He began planning for an insurrection in early 1648, obtaining Tatar military assistance as part of his preparations. In May, a Polish military unit was sent into Ukraine to stop the insurrection and was utterly destroyed in two conflicts. This success signified the start of a large popular uprising. Violence swept across Ukraine as Cossacks and peasants lashed out against those they thought were responsible for Polish tyranny and social injustice, landlords, government officials, Latin and Uniate clergy, and Jews. With the port unwilling to get involved, the Poles took a more direct approach. The Poles fought back in turn, taking revenge on the insubordinate population. In September Komernitsky inflicted another devastating defeat on a newly formed Polish army, marched westward through Galicia, and finally laid siege to Zamosk in Poland proper. He did not exploit his opportunity, and retreated with the appointment of a new king of Poland in November. Komernitsky entered Kiev in January 1649 to thunderous cheers as liberator. Following his arrival in Kyiv, Komernitsky began to think of Ukraine as an independent Cossack state, albeit initially only seeking a resolution of grievances from the Polish crown. He began to lay the foundations of a government and treasury, established a local administration under a new governing class drawn from the Cossack offices, and began negotiations with foreign countries. He was still prepared to accept royal sovereignty and entered into talks with the Poles. However, neither the Treaty of Zedborov in August of 1649, nor a less advantageous agreement two years later was acceptable, neither to the Polish aristocracy, who wanted to keep their privileges, nor to the Cossack rank and file and radicalized masses on Ukraine's side. Despite this, in 1567 Tatar assistance proved useless during critical phases, and Komernitsky began looking for alternative partners. In 1654, an agreement was made between Periaslav and Moscow. This agreement caused a lot of controversies because historians can't agree on what it means. Russian historians say that Ukraine accepted the Tsar's rule and this legitimized Russian rule over Ukraine. But Ukrainian historians say that Moscow recognized Ukraine's autonomy, which was almost like independence. After this agreement was made, Moscow went to war against Poland. Komernitsky became increasingly disillusioned with the Muscovite alliance, despite occasional joint victories. There were disputes over control of conquered territory in Belarus and conflicts over Russian interference in internal Ukrainian affairs. The Russo-Polish rapprochement that ensued the invasion of Poland by Sweden in 1655, Moscow's enemy but Ukraine's potential friend, see First Northern War, was extremely aggravating to the hetman. Komernitsky again looked for new partnerships and coalitions involving Sweden, Transylvania, Brandenburg, Moldavia, and Wallachia, and there were signals that the hetman intended to sever Muscovy's link but died before doing so. Under the Treaty of Hadiak, which was signed in 1658 by Ukrainian ruler Hetman Ivan Vyhovsky and Polish King John II Casimir, central Ukraine was declared a self-governing Grand Duchy of Rus governed by a ruling elite chosen from among nobles and officers. The Treaty of Hadiak was considered disgraceful by the Polish magnates because it had granted concessions to the hated Cossacks, repulsive to the Cossacks and common people for its conservative social caste and Polish connection, and provocative to Moscow. Wyhovski resigned as hetman in protest when opposition mounted. He went into hiding in Poland after being forced out of office. Ukraine began a fast descent into chaos that contemporaries referred to as the ruin, with Wyhovski. Rank and file Cossacks and the peasantry, who were expected to provide labor, became enemies with the Cossack officers, who were undergoing a change into a hereditary landowning class. The period from 1663 to 1667 was a time of hetman rivalry in the two competing Polish and Russian zones of influence. Ukraine was divided down the Dnieper River by the Andrusovo Treaty in 1667, with the West, known as the Right Bank, returning to Poland, while Russia retained control over the East, referred to as the Left Bank, including Kyiv, which actually lay west of the river. The agreement was confirmed by a Treaty of Eternal Peace between Poland and Russia in 1686. The division of Ukraine provoked a reaction among the people. Petro Doroshenko, the hetman of the Right Bank, 
briefly seized control of the left bank and attempted to form a unified Ukrainian state that would be ruled by Turkey. An Ottoman military intervention in 1672, on the other hand, resulted in Podolia's annexation as an Ottoman province for 25 years. As further Ottoman military actions proved fruitless in establishing Doroshenko's power, and as Russian involvement in the war deepened, hope for his reign evaporated. Large numbers of people fled to the left bank and beyond as a result of Ottoman devastation. Two large-scale Ottoman invasions followed Doroshenko's abdication, but a treaty signed in 1681 halted any Turkish military activity on Ukrainian soil. In 1699, Podolia reverted to Polish rule following the conclusion of hostilities with Turkey. The Hetmanate, or Autonomous Hetman State, was reduced territorially to the east in left bank Ukraine after 1667's partition. The Hetman State in right bank Ukraine, which was at least nominally under Polish control by the end of the 18th century, was abolished by the Poles. At the top of the state, the Hetman was elected theoretically by a general Cossack assembly but in practice by senior officers, who were largely controlled by the Tsar's preferences. The terms of autonomy were renegotiated at each election of a new Hetman, and this resulted in a continual reduction of power. Nonetheless, for almost a century, the Hetmanate enjoyed considerable self-government as well as significant economic and cultural progress. The higher-ranking Cossack officers, the Starshina, had established themselves as a hereditary aristocracy with comparable rights to the Polish nobility. The lower half of the common soldiers were no longer distinguishable from the rural inhabitants save in terms of legal status. The situation of the free peasantry deteriorated over time. Their expanding obligations were increasingly reminiscent of serfdom. Urban life, on the other hand, flourished, and the larger cities and a few towns retained municipal self-government. Burghers mostly maintained their civil liberties. In the ecclesiastical realm, the Uniate Church vanished from Cossack-controlled territory, and in 1686, with the creation of the Moscow Patriarchate, the Orthodox Kievan Metropolitanate was transferred under Constantinople. Despite Ukrainian churchmen's eventual dominance within Russia, within the Hetmanate during the 18th century, church autonomy and distinct Ukrainian character gradually eroded. Ivan Mazipa was the hetman of the hetman state. He had a lot of power and was supported by Tsar Peter I. The hetman state reached its peak during his time. There was a lot of art, literature, and architecture in the Cossack Baroque style. The Kievan Mohyla Academy also did well during this time. After the conclusion of the First Northern War, Peter I sought to expand his empire into Moldavia and re-establish a single Ukrainian state. But Peter's centralizing policies and exactions levied on the hetmanate in connection with the Second Northern War appeared to endanger Ukrainian autonomy. In 1708, in order to achieve sovereignty for Ukraine, Mazipa made a secret relationship with Charles XII of Sweden, but their allied forces were defeated in the Battle of Poltava, 1709. Mazipa fled to Moldova, where he died shortly after. Peter even approved a successor to Mazipa, however the Hetmanate's autonomous prerogatives were greatly restricted and weakened throughout the final decades of the 18th century. From 1722 to 1727 and again from 1734 to 1750, the position of Hetman was on hold while Russia implemented new governance structures. In 1750, Empress Elizabeth resurrected the Hetmanate for her favorite brother Kyrylo Rozumovsky. The Hetman and the Starshina, on the other hand, requested that the previous status be restored following Catherine II, the great S rise to power in 1762. Catherine refused their request and forced him to step down in 1764. All signs of Ukrainian autonomy were eradicated over the next 20 years. In 1775, Russian forces raised the Zaporozhian Sikh, a Cossack stronghold. There was a large area to the east of Hetmanate that had remained untouched until the 17th century. The Muscovite government extended its line of fortifications into this region starting in the late 16th century in order to protect themselves from the Tatars. In the 16th century, this region became a place for Ukrainian peasants and Cossacks who were fleeing Polish domination. People who were hurt by the ruin period also came here. They called this place Sloboda Ukraine because of all the free communities that were established. Kherson became the major city in Kharkiv region. Sloboda Ukraine, like the Hetmanate, had a lot of internal autonomy under Russian imperial authorities. However, in 1765 Catherine eliminated Sloboda Ukraine's autonomous status. While the western Ukrainian territories of Galicia and Volhynia were part of the theater of combat during the Komernitsky Rising, they remained firmly under Polish authority after the conflict. The right bank, which is the area after the abatement of the ruin and the retrocession of Podolia by the Turks, reverted to Polish sovereignty. However, it was not until 1714, after further dislocations connected with the Second Northern War, that control was re-established over the area by a weakened Poland. When the Poles arrived in Ukraine, they encountered a society that had very different characteristics from the one they left behind in Halakuna. The Cossacks became almost non-existent as an organized military force. Many cities and towns declined in population. 
This was especially true in the Reich Bank, where the population became more Polish and Jewish. Roman Catholicism still had a privileged status, however, the Uniate Church became more common among Ukrainians, with Orthodoxy having fewer followers. Without a strong central authority or the Cossacks to keep them in check, the Polish nobility controlled the Reich Bank. A few magnate families became virtually independent fiefdoms, with their own privately armed militias, thanks to their huge estates that formed almost completely self-sufficient domains. The depopulated regions were gradually resettled by peasant migrations, often organized by the aristocracy, from Galicia and, particularly, Volhynia. The extensification of the Ensurfed peasantry, combined with excessive exploitation and superior living standards, led to periodic uprisings by bands of rebels known as Haydamaks, Paws. X week, this is Turkish for free booters or marauders. The Kalivchina was the most deadly, occurring in 1768 and being suppressed only with the assistance of Russian soldiers. In three partitions, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth came to an end in 1772, 1793, and 1795. Galicia was annexed by Habsburg Austria in the first separation. In the second arrangement, Russia acquired the right bank in eastern Volhynia. It absorbed the rest of Volhynia in the third. Following the abolition of Hetman autonomy in the Hetmanate and Sloboda Ukraine, as well as the annexation of the right bank and Volhynia, Ukrainian territories within the Russian Empire were completely devoid of any cultural markers. The formal Russian provinces Gubernius, were established, with governor nominees from St. Petersburg in command. The right bank, as well as certain adjacent areas, was part of the Pale of Settlement, where Jewish citizens were legally prohibited from settling. In the 1780s, the sparsely populated southern regions, known as Novorossiya, or New Russia, were settled by Ukrainians from other parts of Ukraine, as well as smaller numbers from Russia, the Balkans, and Germany. This colonization movement led to Ukrainian territory expanding greatly. The new Black Sea port of Odessa grew into a large and cosmopolitan city. The political and social spheres were not neglected. The Cossack Starshina were equalized with the Russian aristocracy as compensation for their lost authority as a ruling class in the Hetmanate, and many joined imperial service while others attained the highest government ranks. The Ukrainian nobility gradually became Russified, as had the earlier Ruthenian nobility, through education, marriage, and government service, though many retained a sentimental connection to the land and its folklore. The Polish nobility in the right bank continued to own a lot of land, but their status eroded over time. This happened especially after the Polish rebellions of 1830-31 and 1863-64. The large Jewish population was oppressed by a variety of legal restrictions and, from 1881, Catherine II's gradual process of enslavement of the peasantry resulted in 1783. However, the obligations were not as bad on the left bank. This was because there was more agitation among the peasant class and also because of Russia's defeat in the Crimean War. This led to the decline of serfdom, but it remained the dominant lot of peasants until 1861 when they were emancipated. Even after emancipation, peasants were still burdened by inadequate land allotments and heavy redemption payments that led to many becoming poor. Despite this, the changes accelerated the growth of industry in the Russian Empire by freeing up land labor. Industrialization was particularly evident in eastern Ukraine, most notably the Donbas region. However, workers attracted to the metallurgical sector and other industrial sectors were generally drawn from other areas of the empire. Ukrainians searching for economic growth tended to move to agricultural regions. As a result, isolated Russified islands emerged in a Ukrainian rural sea in which the expanding working class and growing city centers became highly Russified islands. In both the political and social realms, the Russian regime sought to suppress Ukrainian features. Despite the fact that the largely Polish Roman Catholic Church was permitted to continue, Catherine I began a campaign of administrative Uniate Church conversion. Despite initial resistance, the anti-Uniate campaign was largely unsuccessful during her lifetime. The Uniate Metropolitanate was shut down in 1839, and the Union of Brest-Litovsk was declared void, with the Uniates finally absorbed into the Russian Orthodox Church. The recalcitrant clergy were severely punished as a result of this. In Ukraine, the Russian Orthodox Church became an important tool for imperial regime Russification efforts. In the 19th century, academic circles played a vital role in the development of Ukrainian cultural life. In 1805, Ukraine's first modern university opened in Kharkiv, and for 30 years Sloboda Ukraine was the main center for Ukrainian scholarship and publishing activities. A university was launched in Kyiv in 1834, and one at Odessa was founded in 1865. Though Russian institutions, they did much to encourage research on local history and ethnography, which had a positive influence on the Ukrainian national movement. Nevertheless, it was literature that became the primary tool for the Ukrainian national revival in the 19th century. Taras Shevchenko is undoubtedly Ukraine's most significant writer and, without a doubt, its most important personality in the formation of a modern Ukrainian national consciousness. Shevchenko was a serf who was brought out of slavery by a group of artists who recognized his talent for painting. 
Despite Shevchenko's status as the so-called father of modern Ukrainian painting, he wrote over 500 works, including epic romanticizations of Cossack glory, wrathful indictments of social and national oppression under the Tsars, mystical reflections based on biblical prophets, and fantastic in folk-like ballads. Shevchenko's poetry had a major influence on subsequent Ukrainian literature. Not just because it was seminal but also because it represented a vision of Ukraine as a free and democratic society with an enduring impact on Ukrainian political theory. Concerned Tsarist authorities grew increasingly concerned by the mid-19th century as cultural and literary fermentations began to take hold in Ukraine. In the official telling, Ukrainians were seen as a subgroup of Russians known as Little Russian, who were torn away from their motherland by the Mongol Tatars and diverted from their proper historical path by Poland's pernicious influence. As a result, Ukraine was reintegrated fully into the Russian body politic. Shevchenko's patriotic poem earned him imprisonment and years of exile in Central Asia. The interior minister, Pyotr Valuev, banned almost all publications in Ukrainian except for lovely letters in 1863. The ban was reinforced and extended by a secret imperial decree, the Emzukaz, issued by Alexander II in 1876, which prohibited the publication of Bell's Lettre in Ukrainian, the importation of books in that language, and public readings and stage performances. With such stringent rules, Ukrainian writers were unable to publish their work in Galicia, where it would be accessible to readers. Even the most basic education was prohibited. Writers from occupied Ukraine could only see their works published in Austrian Galicia as a result of these restrictions. Many prominent figures in the national movement relocated there. Because of the Tsarist regime's repression and the still pre-industrial, largely rural nature of Ukrainian society at the time, a political movement could not develop. The Cyril and Methodius Brotherhood, a secret society that existed for only a few years in the mid-19th century, sought social equality, national liberation, and a Slavic confederation ruled by Ukraine. The Brotherhood was exposed and stomped out, and its leaders were imprisoned and disciplined. Under illegal circumstances, various cities saw the formation of clandestine societies during the second half of the 1800s to promote Ukrainian culture, education, and publishing. The top political thinker of the time, Mihailo Drahomanov, who pushed for the reform of the Tsarist Empire into a federative republic in which Ukrainian national rights would be protected. At the turn of the century, younger, mostly student-led groups began taking part in more politicized activities. In 1900, a pamphlet written by one such organization in Kharkiv called for one single indivisible free independent Ukraine as a political objective for the first time. In 1905, a revolutionary upheaval shook the Russian Empire, and it inspired worker strikes and rural disturbances in Ukraine. The Tsarist autocracy's transition to a semi-constitutional monarchy resulted in a degree of relaxation for Ukrainian national life. The prohibition on Ukrainian language publications was lifted, and popular enlightenment and learning societies were formed, as were theatrical troops and musical ensembles. Nonetheless, the number of people affected by these cultural projects remained small, and the Ukrainian language was still prohibited from schools. In the political environment, the establishment of an elected body, or Duma, in 1906 provided Ukrainians with a new platform to voice their national issues for the first time. Ukrainians had a significant presence in the short-lived First and Second Duma, and they established their own caucus. Under the Third and Fourth Duma, Ukraine's representation and effectiveness in the parliament was severely curtailed by changes in electoral legislation that favored rich farmers over poor ones. Until the Russian Revolution of 1917, politically active Ukrainians demanding language and cultural rights as well as some form of local autonomy dominated Ukrainian politics. Following the Habsburgs' acquisition of Galicia from Poland in 1772, they took possession of Bukovina from Moldavia two years later. Pre-existing under Habsburg rule as part of the Hungarian crown was Transcarpathia, which was inhabited by Ukrainians. These three territories shared several experiences in common within the Habsburg Empire albeit they were distinguished by distinctions that came from the distinct ethnic cultures and prior histories. Galicia was joined administratively with purely Polish regions to its west into a single province, with Lviv as the provincial capital. The long-term dominance of the Polish noble class in Galicia and their privileged position as major landowners, the vast majority of them being Poles, helped to create Polish-Ukrainian animosity. A further element was that, in the province's Ukrainian part, the Poles took over from the Ukrainians as Poland's dominant landlord race and ruled the major cities, though many settlements were largely Jewish. Although Habsburg policies favored the Poles, Ukrainians in Austria had considerably more possibilities for their national development and made significantly greater progress than did Ukrainians in Tsarist Russia. The Austrian rulers, Maria Theresa and Joseph II, and the creation of the imperial bureaucracy in Galicia benefited Ukrainians. The peasantry benefited from the restriction of the unpaid labor and the abolition of personal servitude to landowners in 1780s, as well as from new techniques in agriculture promoted by enlightened monarchs. Municipal changes reversed urban civilization's deterioration and improved the legal and social status of Ukrainians. 
Educational changes implemented as early as 1775 allowed for pupils to study in their native language, although in practice Ukrainian language education was restricted until the mid-19th century. The fortunes of the Uniate Church increased as well. In 1774, it was renamed the Greek Catholic Church and, by imperial decree, was accorded the same level of rights as the Roman Catholic Church in 1807, with its headquarters in Lviv. The authorities in the imperial government were careful to raise the educational standards of the clergy. In the early decades of the 19th century, almost all of the clergy who had been trained at new institutions formed an educated class. Their children, who were starting to enter secular professions, gave rise to a Ukrainian intelligentsia. During the 19th century, the Greek Catholic Church became a major national as well as religious institution. The Austrians' Ukrainian uprising of 1848 politicized the Galician Ukrainians, see Revolutions of 1848. The Supreme Ruthenian Council, formed to voice Ukrainian concerns, declared that Austria's Ruthenians belonged to the Ukrainians under Russian rule and called for the division of Galicia into Polish and Ukrainian provinces. These were to include Bukovina and Transcarpathia. A National Guard and other minor military units were established, as well as a newspaper in Ukrainian. The revolution, however, had significant ramifications for Galician society. In 1848, the unpaid labor was done away with. However, poor economic conditions among the Ukrainian peasantry grew as a result of lax land reform and rural overcrowding, as well as a near-total absence of industry to absorb surplus labor. Large-scale emigration to North America, particularly the United States, Canada, Brazil, and Argentina, began in the 1880s and continued until World War I. The imperial regime also struck a bargain with the Polish nobility in 1848, giving up political control of Galicia to them. Despite the fact that Austria gained a constitution and parliament in the 1860s, the local Polish supremacy was little affected by them. The governors appointed by Vienna were all Polish aristocracy. Lviv University and the civil service were both Polonized. Lviv's parliament and diet elected under a curial system that favored the landed and urban classes routinely produced commanding Polish majorities, as voting was based on a curial system that favored the landowning and urban classes. Curie were political organizations representing various communities and classes of people who cast votes. In cultural and educational areas, the occasional efforts by imperial authorities to foster a Polish-Ukrainian reunion failed to result in more than minor concessions. The major demands of Ukrainian parliamentary representatives, including the division of Galicia along ethnic lines, the replacement of the curial electoral system with universal suffrage, and the establishment of a Ukrainian university in Lviv, were not fulfilled. The Habsburgs were disappointing and the new Polish ascendancy was a concern for the older, more conservative, clerical intelligentsia. This led to pro-Russian sympathies among this group in the 1860s. The Russophiles wanted to create a new language that was a mixture of Ukrainian and Russian. They also wanted to have a cultural and political connection to Russia. However, they lost out to the populists in the 1870s. The populists believed that people should use their own language and that it was important for Ukrainians to maintain their ethnic identity within Austria-Hungary and the Russian Empire. The Narodivtsi developed a strong press and founded many associations starting in 1868. These associations were important for writers and scholars in the Ukrainian area that was controlled by the Russians. People started to self-organize in the late 19th century. This included groups for women and youth, performance ensembles, cooperatives, and credit unions. In the 1890s, political parties also started to form. However, by this time the people who loved Russia had been discredited. They still controlled many important Ukrainian institutions in Galicia, but they were being challenged by a more patriotic group of people. This group was led by Ivan Franco and Mikhailo Pavlik. The ethnic conflict in Galicia was getting worse and worse. In 1902, there were huge peasant strikes against the Polish landlords. Ukrainian university students were protesting and having conflicts with the Poles. In 1908, a student assassinated the governor of Galicia. In 1907, the Austrian parliament voted to give all men the right to vote. This strengthened Ukrainian representation in Vienna and put more pressure on the provincial government to make a similar change. However, tensions between Ukraine and Russia caused Vienna to look for a compromise between the two groups. But Polish opposition kept the old voting system in place until the end. After the start of World War I, Ukrainians in Austrian Galicia were still a mostly agricultural and politically disadvantaged people. They had, however, made significant educational and cultural gains, including a large native intelligentsia and an extensive institutional infrastructure, as well as a high level of national consciousness, which contrasted sharply with the situation in Russian-controlled Ukraine. Between the Middle Dniester River and the main Carpathian Range, Bukovina was a part of Kievan Rus and the Galician Volhynian Principality. Moldavia incorporated it into 14th century and, in the 16th century, became a vassal of the Ottoman Empire. At that time, there were benational Orthodox Christians living there. Ukrainians dominated in the north and Romanians in the south. 
The Habsburgs implemented similar reforms as those in Galicia right away. From 1787 to 1849, Bukovina was a distinct administrative district of Galicia it achieved complete sovereignty in 1861. As a result of immigration, significant Jewish and German communities were established in the 19th century. Galician Germans spoke a dialect of High German, while both Ukrainian and Romanian were spoken in public life and, in certain disciplines, at the local university. As Ukrainians attempted to equalize Orthodox Church administration throughout the century, Romanian-Ukrainian rivalry increased, although it did not reach the intensity of Galicia's conflict. Following a similar network of cultural and civic organizations and publishing, enterprises was established, Ukraine's national movement in Bukovina mirrored those in Galicia during the late 1860s. A comparable cultural and civic organization infrastructure, as well as a similar publication industry, was developed. Ukrainian education and educational facilities were better than any other Ukrainian regions. Transcarpathia, which is located south of the Carpathian Mountains, was formally separated from other ethnically Ukrainian regions both geographically and institutionally. Transcarpathia was incorporated into Hungary in 1015, and it remained a part of Hungary for almost a century before becoming part of Czechoslovakia as a result of World War I. After the Habsburgs took control of Hungary, it came in the 16th-17th centuries under their reign. Following the Union of Ushorid in 1646, the Uniate Church became dominant in the religious world on terms similar to those established by the Union of brest litovsk Transcarpathia was largely rural and home to a Ukrainian, Ruthenian, peasantry, a powerful Hungarian landowning aristocracy, and a significant number of urban and rural Jews. Under Hungary's rule, Transcarpathia was divided into counties governed by officials appointed from Budapest. From the late 18th century, when Vienna began to implement educational and social changes, Hungarian noble opposition proved fatal. However, educational levels, at the time higher than in Galicia, began to fall in the early 19th century. Until mid-century, however, ecclesiastical and cultural ties with Galicia remained strong. The Hungarian Revolution of 1848 took a strongly nationalistic bent, alienating many of the country's Slav minorities. Its suppression by Russian forces in 1849 sparked support for Russia among Transcarpathia's intelligentsia, leading to the creation of Russophilism as the area's main cultural and political movement. The Ozglike, however, the political agreement that created the dual Austro-Hungarian monarchy in 1867 transferred authority over domestic policies to Hungary's oligarchy. A growing inclination to majorization emerged as a result of increased restrictions on the Ruthenian language in schools and publishing. A Ukrainophile populist movement first emerged as a counterpoint to Russophilism and majorization in the early part of the 20th century. Ukrainian national awareness was still quite undeveloped in Transcarpathia at the start of World War I. The outbreak of World War I and the start of hostilities between Russia and Austria-Hungary on August 1, 1914, had significant consequences for Ukraine's citizens on both sides. Ukrainian periodicals and cultural organizations were immediately prohibited in the Russian Empire, as well as prominent personalities. As Russian forces advanced into Galicia in September, the Austrians retreating from them killed thousands of people who they suspected were supporters of the Russians. After occupying Galicia, Tsarist authorities took steps to fully incorporate it into the Russian Empire. The government in exile responded by seizing control of the Rada, closing down schools and universities, and preparing to dissolve the Greek Catholic Church. The Austrian recapture of Western Ukraine in May 1915 ultimately halted the Russification campaign. However, western Ukraine remained a theater of war for another year, with significant damage inflicted. Following the Russian Revolution of February 1917, the provisional government took power and immediately expanded freedom of speech and assembly. The Tsarist limitations on religious minorities were lifted by this government. National life in Ukraine got more exciting with the revival of the Ukrainian press and the formation of many cultural and professional associations, as well as political parties. In March, these new organizations came together to form the Central Rada in Kyiv as a Ukrainian representative body. In April, the All-Ukrainian National Congress, which was more widely representative, declared the Central Rada to be Ukraine's highest national authority and elected historian Mihailo Rushevsky as its president. The Central Rada's main objective was for Ukraine to receive territorial independence and for Russia to become a democratic federal republic. Despite the provisional government's acknowledgement of Ukraine's right to self-government and the Central Rada as a legitimate representative body, there were still issues regarding its territorial authority and political prerogatives. In eastern Ukraine, the Rada had to compete with the radical Soviets of workers and soldiers' deputies. However, their support was quite limited in the Ukrainian population. Following the Bolshevik coup in Petrograd, now St. Petersburg, on November 7, 1917, Ukrainian-Russian relations deteriorated rapidly. However, a number of individuals who had served in the old regime believed that they still possessed some sort of power. 
the Central Council refused to recognize the new government's authority over Ukraine and on November 20 proclaimed the creation of the Ukrainian National Republic while maintaining its association with Russia, which was expected to emerge from the pending Constituent Assembly. The Bolsheviks established their own administration in Ukraine, which was recognized by the Soviet government in Moscow. In December, a rival regime was formed in Kiev after the All-Ukrainian Congress of Soviets, when the Bolsheviks declared Ukraine to be a Soviet republic and created their own government. In January 1918, the Bolsheviks launched an offensive in the left bank of Ukraine and advanced on Kyiv. On January 22, the Central Rada issued a declaration of full independence for Ukraine. At the same time, it passed a law establishing autonomous status for Ukraine's Jewish, Russian, and Polish minorities. However, the government quickly had to evacuate to the right bank because Soviet troops occupied Kyiv. On February 9, Ukraine and the Central Powers signed the Peace Treaty of brest litovsk a German-Austrian offensive dislodged the Bolsheviks from Kyiv in early March, and the Rada government returned to the capital. In April, the Red Army retreated from Ukraine. The German High Command sought to maximize agricultural production for its own war effort, whereas the Ukrainian nationalization policies, particularly land confiscation, ran counter to the military's interests. On April 29, 1918, General Pavlo Skoropadsky toppled the government with a German-backed coup. Skoropadsky, a collateral descendant of a late 18th-century Cossack hetman, identified himself as the hetman of Ukraine, revoked all acts passed by the previous government, and established a conservative regime that depended on landowners and the largely Russian urban middle class for support. The new administration was met with fierce resistance from Ukrainian nationalists, socialists, and the peasantry. The popular movement, which was supported by the British government and financed by right-wing extremists in Western Europe, forced a number of Ukrainian political forces to collaborate. The Ukrainian National Union was formed by the main parties and civil organizations to organize political opposition, while peasants demonstrated their animosity through uprisings and partisan conflict. In early January, the Allied powers recognized Skoropadsky's government as the legitimate Ukrainian administration. On November 14, after Germany and Austria had surrendered, Skoropadsky's regime lost its main prop. The Ukrainian National Union established the directory of the Ukrainian National Republic to plan for his ouster, and Skoropadsky announced his desire to join with a future non-Bolshevik Russia, triggering an insurrection. Hetman Kostyantinovich abdicated on December 14, and the directory assumed power in Kyiv. Even before the collapse of Austria-Hungary, some Western Ukrainian political leaders declared the formation of a state in October 1918. This new state was called the Western Ukrainian National Republic and it included Galicia, Northern Bukovina, and Transcarpathia. In November 1, Ukrainian forces occupied Lviv. The Treaty of Versailles signaled the end of World War I, but it also created a major problem for Ukraine, how to govern Galicia, which was still held by Poland after the signing of peace. The Poles laid siege to Lviv on November 21, but most of Galicia remained Ukrainian-held, and Yevhen Petrushevich's government transferred its headquarters to Staini Slavov, now ivano frankisk on January 22, 1919, in Kyiv, an act of union was signed between Ukraine and Little Russia. Although there was political integration owing to the continuing armed confrontations, actual political integration was impeded by the fighting. These ultimately proved disadvantageous for Ukrainians, with the Poles taking complete control of Galicia by late July. Petrushevich and his cabinet fled to right-bank Ukraine and subsequently relocated to Vienna, where they continued their efforts to have Poland recognize the occupation. The directory that came to power in December 1918, initially led by Volodymyr Vinychenko and from February 1919 by Simon Petlyura, who was also the commander-in-chief, officially resurrected the Ukrainian National Republic and re-established Central Rada legislation in Kyiv. Throughout the late 1980s and early 1990s, however, it was hampered by the growing chaotic domestic situation and a hostile worldwide environment. As the common people grew angry and the army dispirited, rambunctious chieftains, often referred to as Otomani, increased in scale and ferocity. In addition, under the command of the charismatic anarchist leader Nesta Makhno, a large irregular force appeared. In many locations, the government's power was little or non-existent. The Allied powers, including as France, which had a contingent in Odessa, backed the Russian whites, who were gathering around General Anton Denikin in southern Russia. As authority broke down in Ukraine, random violence increased. In particular, a ferocious wave of pogroms against the Jewish population left thousands dead. In 1919, the most of the pogroms occurred, when virtually all active and reserve forces from both regular and irregular camps were mobilized in Ukraine, including directory troops, Otomani, white troops, and Red Army soldiers. Peasants and landowners from both peasant and landlord castes were also involved. In December 1918, the Bolsheviks had already begun a fresh offensive in eastern Ukraine. The Bolsheviks retook Kyiv in February 1919. The Directory, which had been located in the left bank since its creation, moved to the right bank during this period. 
Denikin launched his campaign against the Bolsheviks in the left bank in May. His movement westward was marked by terror, restoration of noble landownership, and the destruction of all manifestations of Ukrainian national life. On August 31st, Petlyura's Ukrainian troops and Denikin's white regiments both entered Kyiv, with both forces withdrawing after a few days to avoid open conflict. The Ukrainians remained with Denikin for three months, from September through December. They lost ground and began a retreat northwestward into Volhynia as the Ukrainian army fought Denikin in the fall. The Ukrainians switched to guerrilla warfare after being confronted by the Poles in the west, the Reds in the north, and the Whites in the south. In December 1918, Petlyura traveled to Warsaw in order to seek outside help. At the same time, the Bolsheviks were repelling Denikin's troops and regained Kyiv on December 16. The Whites were driven from Ukrainian soil by February 1920. The Treaty of Warsaw, signed in April 1920, was the result of negotiations between Petlyura and the Polish government of Joseph Pilsudski, which culminated in Galicia and Western Volhynia being ceded to Ukraine as a reward for Polish military aid. On May 5, the Polish-Ukrainian forces launched a campaign and captured Kyiv on May 6. The Bolsheviks mounted a counterattack in August that pushed them to the outskirts of Warsaw. The tide of war turned yet again as the Polish and Ukrainian forces drove the Soviets back across the right bank. However, in October Poland made a truce with the Soviets, and in March 1921 they signed the Treaty of Riga. Poland recognized Soviet Ukraine while keeping its western Ukrainian territories annexed by. This was also known as the Intervention. After the First World War and the revolutionary uprisings that followed, Ukraine was split among four sovereignties. Bukovina was incorporated into Romania. Transcarpathia was incorporated into Czechoslovakia, becoming a new country. Poland annexed Galicia and western Volhynia, as well as smaller adjacent areas in the northwest, forming Soviet Ukraine. The Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic was formed as a result of the Bolshevik Revolution's success in establishing a socialist government in Ukraine. The first all-Ukrainian Congress of Soviets, which was led by the Bolsheviks, formed a Soviet government for Ukraine in December 1917. The second, in March 1918, declared Ukrainian Soviet Republic independent and the third, in March 1919, established Soviet Ukraine's first constitution. These moves were a response to the challenge of rising Ukrainian nationalism. With Bolshevik rule, Soviet Ukraine progressively gave up its rights in areas like foreign relations and foreign trade to Russia. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, a union of Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and the Transcaucasian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic, SFSR, was formed on December 30, 1922. The first constitution for the new multinational federation was ratified in January 1924. This document formalized the relationship between the constituent republics and the central government in Moscow. While the constituent republics retained the formal right of secession, the jurisdiction was limited to domestic affairs. The Communist Party organs in Moscow controlled foreign relations, the military, commerce and transportation. With the defeat of the Bolsheviks' rivals, Communist Party dominance reigned supreme at all levels of government, as well as over the military and secret police. The Communist Party of Ukraine, or CPBU, as it was also known, persisted as a highly centralized body. Despite the efforts of such national-minded Bolsheviks as Mykola Skripnik to declare the CPBU an independent organization at its founding congress in Kiev in July 1918, the CPBU, Bolshevik, or CPCU declared itself to be an integral part of a single Russian, after 1924, all-Union, Communist Party and subordinated to its Congresses and Central Committee. The CPBU was a political party established to support Ukrainian independence. Although it was subordinate to Moscow, the CPBU was mostly non-Ukrainian in ethnicity. At the time of its creation, less than 5,000 members made up 7% Ukrainian. In 1920, the Ukrainian element in the Communist Party was bolstered with the addition of Barotbists, members of the Independist and non-Bolshevik Ukrainian Communist Party, which was founded in 1919. Ukrainians, on the other hand, made up less than 20% of CPBU membership at that time. The Bolsheviks had little popular support because they were mostly foreign to nation and ideologically prepossessed in favor of the proletariat, over 90% of Ukraine's population were peasants. In the 1920s, the Bolsheviks faced two main tasks. They had to rebuild the economy, and they also had to conciliate the non-Russian nationalities. However, the policy of war communism, based on nationalization of all enterprises and the forcible requisition of food, wreaked economic havoc. It was compounded by drought, which led to a famine in Ukraine in 1921 that killed one million people. In March 1921, Vladimir Lenin unleashed the New Economic Policy or NEP, which partially restored private enterprise in industry and trade while also replacing grain seizures with a fixed tax and the right to sell extra crops on the free market. By 1927, the Ukrainian economy had recovered to its pre-revolutionary level, with certain groups of people seeing prosperity. 
In parallel with the NEP, the Bolsheviks implemented policies to appeal and penetrate non-Russian nationalities. In 1923, a policy of indigenization was announced, including education in local languages, publishing in local languages, workplace support for native culture development, and government recruiting of indigenous personnel. This program began a decade of Ukrainianization in Ukraine. This meant that more Ukrainians were involved in the government and culture. The number of schools teaching in Ukrainian increased, and more Ukrainian books were published. Lively debates erupted about the history of Ukrainian literature, with Mykola Kavilovy preaching, away from Moscow and calling for a cultural orientation toward Europe. The Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church was an important force behind Ukraine's national rebirth, despite anti-religious propaganda and persecution. Ukrainization was a policy adopted by the Ukrainian Communist Party or UCP in 1932. Many people, including Ukrainian Bolsheviks like Skripnik and Kavilovy, as well as the previous Barotbists, supported Ukrainization. This was the process of making Ukraine more Ukrainian. One way this occurred is by making Ukrainian the primary language spoken in Ukraine. The party's leadership, on the other hand, was divided on the issue. The non-Ukrainian CPBU leaders and functionaries opposed the policy strongly. Although Stalin was increasing his grip on the Communist Party apparatus in Moscow, there was concern among some that a national revival would weaken him further. Lazar Kaganovich, Stalin's trusted lieutenant, was sent to head the CPBU in 1925. Within a year, Kaganovich had engineered a split among the national communists, Kavilovy's recantation, and the expulsion of Shumsky and his followers from the party. Nevertheless, with Skripnik as the new commissar of education, Ukrainization continued to advance. By the end of the 1920s, Stalin had carried out a new revolution from above. The end of the NEP and the start of breakneck industrialization was marked by the introduction of his first five-year plan in 1928. Ukraine's economy and social life changed rapidly. By the time of World War II, the country's industrial production had quadrupled, the number of workers had tripled, and the urban population had grown from 19 to 34 percent. Ukraine boasts a diversified economy with major industrial, agricultural, and service sectors. With a sectoral bias toward heavy industry and a regional concentration in the Donbas and central Dnieper region, Ukraine has seen significant industrial growth. The cost of the fast industrialization was borne by the peasantry. In 1928, the regime introduced special measures against the Kuliks. In 1931, the Soviet government's campaign against Kuliks began. It was a successful attempt to destroy the farming class in Russia by removing all property and forcing them into collective farms. By the mid-1930s, some 100,000 families had been deported to Siberia and Kazakhstan. Wholesale collectivization began in 1929. This was when the percentage of farms collectivized increased from 9 to 65 percent in a very short period of time. More than 90 percent of farms were collectivized by the end of 1935. However, the people did not want this change and revolted. The government responded by making the quotas for farm deliveries even higher and taking food away from the people who resisted. The result of Stalin's policies was the 1932 Great Famine, which was a man-made catastrophe without parallel in peacetime. With almost 4 million deaths, Ukraine bore the brunt of Soviet mortality rates. The famine was an attack on the Ukrainian peasantry and village. The famine happened because the people did not want to join collective farms. Ukraine's deliberate natures are emphasized by the fact that no physical cause for starvation existed there. The Ukrainian grain harvest of 1932 was lower than expected, partly owing to the upheaval caused by the collectivization campaign, but it was more than enough to feed everyone. Nevertheless, Soviet authorities set requisition quotas for Ukraine at an impossibly high level. Brigades of special agents were dispatched to Ukraine to try and get as much food as possible. Homes were routinely searched and foodstuffs confiscated. At the same time, in August 1932, a new bill was passed making theft of socialist property punishable by death, resulting in scenes of peasants being shot for stealing as little as a bag of wheat from state warehouses. The rural population had insufficient food to eat. By the spring of 1933, however, starvation had spread across the countryside. Moscow refused to give aid, and instead exported over a million tons of grain to Europe during this period. The famine ended after the harvest in 1933. The traditional Ukrainian village had been destroyed, so settlers from Russia were brought in to repopulate the area. Soviet authorities denied that anything was wrong with Ukraine at this time. It wasn't until the 1980s that they admitted something had gone wrong. The Soviet regime began a campaign to get rid of any nationalist deviations, around the same time as it started industrialization and collectivization drives. This campaign escalated into a virtual assault on Ukrainian culture. The Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church was shut down in 1930, with the arrest and exile of its hierarchy and clergy. The Union for the Liberation on Ukraine is said to have been revealed by the secret police in 1929 as a clandestine organization. 
In 1930, the leaders of Ukraine, including a famous literary critic, were put on trial. They were sentenced to labor camps. Many intellectuals, writers, and artists were arrested, imprisoned, exiled, or killed. By the end of 1933, Ukrainization had stopped and a policy of Russification began. The CPBU changed a lot after the Stalinist upheavals. Kaganovich came back to Moscow in 1928 and Stanislav Kosior became the party chief. Pavel Postashev became the second secretary in 1933 and he brought many Russian cadres with him to help out. From 1929 to 1934, a series of purges removed from the party the generation of revolutionaries, Ukrainization supporters, and people who criticized the collectivization excesses. Mykola Skripnik, Ukraine's most renowned old Bolshevik, killed himself in 1933. Even though Stalin's loyalists filled party ranks and leadership positions, a new wave of purges during 1936 to 1938 reduced the number of members in the Communist Party of Ukraine by half. 99 of 102 members of the party's Central Committee were executed. On July 12, 1934, Stalin relieved Postashev and Kosior from their party duties. Nikita Khrushchev, the son of a prominent Bolshevik who had been imprisoned for opposing Stalin in the 1920s, came to Kiev from Moscow with a large number of Communist Party supporters to take control of the CPBU. Finally, at the start of World War II, both terror and tumult within the party began to decrease. There were important differences between the two regions that became part of Poland again. Galicia was less ethnically homogeneous than other regions in Austria. However, starting from the Austrian period, Galician Ukrainians brought a long history of self-organization and political participation. They also inherited a broad network of cultural and civic associations, educational establishments, and publishing enterprises. And in the Greek Catholic Church they possessed an influential national, as well as religious, institution. The population of Volhynia was more heavily Ukrainian, but this was mostly because of the Russian rule that had been going on for around 100 years. There wasn't much of a tradition of national life or education during this time, and people didn't really have much political experience either. The dominant Orthodox Church in Ukraine was originally a stronghold of Russian influence. However, in the two decades before World War II, there was considerable national integration between Galician and Volhynian Ukrainians, even though the Poles tried to stop it from happening. All citizens of Poland were supposed to have the same rights under the 1921 Constitution. However, in practice, people who were not Polish and who did not belong to the Catholic faith had a lot of trouble getting ahead. Although the Allied powers in 1923 accepted the Polish annexation of Galicia on the condition that it be granted regional autonomy, the government began dismantling Habsburg-era institutions of local self-government as soon as possible. Galician authorities appointed by the Polish government were responsible for administering eastern Little Poland. The Sakhal border, a special administrative line between Galicia and Volhynia to prevent the spread of Ukrainian ideas from Galicia to Volhynia, was established. In 1924, the Ukrainian language was banned from use in state institutions and government agencies. The government encouraged Polish agricultural settlement in the face of economic recession, industrial underdevelopment, and massive rural overcrowding, further aggravating ethnic divisions. The regime resorted to more heavy-handed tactics as Ukrainian nationalist activities accelerated toward the end of the 1920s and 1930s. Some organizations were banned, and in 1930 a military and police pacification campaign resulted in numerous arrests, widespread brutality and intimidation, as well as property damage. The schools were at the heart of much of the Ukrainian-Polish dispute. The government first sought to establish a uniform national educational system and develop the Polish school network. However, by the 1930s, overt Polonization of education was actively encouraged. The number of Ukrainian schools fell dramatically. The pre-existing Lviv chairs for Ukrainians in higher education were abolished, and a promised separate Ukrainian university was never allowed to be established. From 1921 to 1925, an underground Ukrainian university operated in Lviv. In a culture where nationality and religion were nearly inseparable, the church played an essential role. The Greek Catholic Church in Galicia, under the direction of highly venerated Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky, used a variety of priests and monastic orders to carry out its religious mission. The church also had a network of seminaries, schools, charitable and social service organizations, museums, and periodicals. Catholicism of the Roman Rite retained its privileged position under the Vatican-Polish Concordat of 1925, but Greek Catholic Christianity was safeguarded from overt government interference by the Vatican-Polish Agreement of 1925. Nevertheless it was not permitted to expand its operations past the Sakhal board. Orthodoxy remained the most popular religion in the northwestern Ukrainian areas. In Volhynia, a nationally conscious clergy and lay intelligentsia played an important role in Ukrainian culture, although Russian domination at the level of ecclesiastical governance persisted. The Polish authorities promoted and, at times by force, compelled many Orthodox people to convert to Roman Catholicism in the 1930s. 
Hundreds of Orthodox churches were seized for closure, demolition, or transfer to the Roman Catholic Church during a campaign that lasted until World War II. Despite official obstruction and persecution, communal life in Galicia developed on the foundations laid down during Austrian rule. Cultural, academic, professional, women's and youth organizations flourished. In economic downturn and public sector discrimination, the cooperative movement experienced a major development. In Volhynia, particularly, significant progress was made. However, in ethnically mixed border regions of the Northwest, where all Ukrainian organizations were banned by the 1930s and education was only taught in Polish. Ukrainian political life was characterized by a struggle with the Poles. The Galician Ukrainians boycotted the first elections to the Polish Sejm, Diet, and Senate, in 1922. In Volhynia, the Ukrainians fought and, in partnership with the Jews and other minorities, won by a wide margin against Polish opponents. Both Galician and Volhynian Ukrainians took part in later elections, which, however, were tainted by violence, intimidation, and fraud. The centrist Ukrainian National Democratic Alliance was the most powerful political organization in Galicia, attempting to extract concessions from the Polish government and inform public opinion. In Volhynia, left-wing organizations, socialists and communist front organizations, had a lot more strength. Under Polish domination, revolutionary nationalism became an important force. The clandestine Ukrainian military organization was founded in 1920 by veterans of the independence struggle, led by Yevhen Konovales. In 1929, the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists or OUN was formed. This was an underground movement that became known for its authoritarian structure, conspiratorial methods, and belief in the primacy of the nation over the individual. The OUN was responsible for acts of sabotage and assassinations of Polish officials. Despite being opposed by the Ukrainian Democratic Parties and the Greek Catholic Church, the OUN gained a wide following among students and peasant youth in the 1930s. This was more true in Galicia than in Volhynia. Ukrainians made up two-fifths of the population in the formerly Austrian province of Bukovina, but two-thirds in the northern half, in 1931. Following Austria's collapse, northern Bukovina was declared a part of the Western Ukrainian National Republic for a short period before being seized by the Romanian army in November 1918. Under the state of emergency that lasted from 1919 to 1928, Bukovina was subjected to intense assimilationist pressures. Provincial self-government was ended, and the Ukrainian language was removed from official usage. The extensive Ukrainian school system and university chairs at Chernivtsi were closed down, as well as the Ukrainian press and most organizations. Assimilationist policies were reversed after 1928, but with Karol II's royal dictatorship in 1938, Ukrainian culture was suppressed for a second time. Transcarpathia, like other Ukrainian regions, was annexed to Czechoslovakia in March 1939. On the basis of a negotiated agreement, Transcarpathia voluntarily joined Czechoslovakia in 1919 under the official name of Subcarpathian Ruthenia. Its anticipated autonomy was not put into effect until 1938, and the region was governed largely by Prague-based officials. Nonetheless, during the democratic Czechoslovak period, Transcarpathia had the greatest degree of freedom among any Ukrainian territory. The changes improved social and economic conditions in the formerly undeveloped region. Significant improvements were made in education and culture. Civilian politics flourished during this period. The question of a people's national orientation was at the center of political debate throughout interwar Transcarpathia. The struggle for national allegiance was between three major trends, the Russophiles, the traditional intelligentsia, a Ruthenian current, and a populist Ukrainophile movement that gathered members from among the younger intelligentsia and by the end of the 1930s was gaining in strength. In October 1938, after the Munich Agreement was signed, Western Czechoslovakia was annexed by Germany. As a result, Prague finally granted Carpatho-Ukraine autonomy. In November, Hungary occupied a strip of territory which included the Carpatho-Ukrainian capital of Uzhorod. The autonomous government transferred its seat to Kust. On March 15, 1939, the Diet proclaimed the independence of Carpatho-Ukraine while the country was in the middle of being occupied by Hungarian troops. For the duration of World War II, Transcarpathia was again controlled by Hungary. On September 1, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland. This began World War II. A few weeks later, in accordance with a secret agreement between Germany and the Soviet Union, Western Volhynia and most of Galicia were occupied by Soviet troops and soon became part of the Ukrainian SSR. In June 1940 Northern Bukovina was taken and annexed by the Soviet Union from Romania, which sided with Germany during the war. The replacement of Polish and Romanian with Ukrainian in state administration and education was tempered by a ban on all existing groups, Sovietization of institutional life, and incarcerations of political leaders and community activists. More than one million individuals were deported to the East between mid-1941 and mid-1942, including a significant number of Poles and Jews. 
the ethnically diverse western borderlands, which were home to over 500,000 Ukrainians, were incorporated into Poland's pre-war administrative region by the Nazis. German oversight permitted a restricted linguistic and cultural revival in the extremely Polonized region, but political activity was prohibited other than for the OUN. The organization of Ukrainian nationalists was rent by factionalism between supporters of Andriy Melnik, who directed the organization from abroad after Konovelt's assassination by a Soviet agent in 1938, and followers of Stepan Bandera, who had real-world experience in the conspiratorial underground. After a congress convened in Kraków in February 1940, when the Melnik and Bandera factions divided into separate organizations, OUNM and OUNB, differing in ideology, strategy, and tactics. On June 22, 1941, the German surprise attack on the Soviet Union began. During their hurried retreat, the Soviets were quick to kill their political detainees and, as much as possible, transported personnel, demolished industrial plants, and practiced a scorched earth policy, blowing up buildings and installations, eradicating crops and food reserves, and flooding mines. The war engulfed a huge section of the Russian Federation, including areas previously untouched by conflict. The Soviets repelled the Wehrmacht's initial assaults, and they were soon driven back to their starting lines in the winter of 1941-1942. In December, nearly all of Ukraine had been seized by the German invaders. Some of the Ukrainian people initially greeted the Germans as liberators. There had long been a widespread feeling in Galicia that Germany, as the declared enemy of Poland and the USSR, was the Ukrainians' natural ally in their quest for independence. On the day of German invasion, July 22, members of OUNB, who proclaimed Ukraine's restoration and the formation of a provisional government on that same day, accompanied him into Lviv. Within days, organizers of this action were arrested and interned in concentration camps, as were both Bandera and Melnik. The Nazis in August attached Galicia administratively to Poland, returned Bukovina to Romania, and gave Romania control over the region between the Dniester and southern Bur rivers as Transnistria with Odessa as its capital. The remainder was divided among Ukraine, Belarus, and Sudetenland. In the occupied territories, the Nazis sought to implement their racial policies. In the fall of 1941 began the mass killings of Jews that continued through 1944. An estimated 1.5 million Ukrainian Jews perished, and over 800,000 were displaced to the east. At Baby Yar in Kyiv, nearly 34,000 were killed in just the first two days of massacre in the city. The Nazis were aided at times by auxiliary forces recruited from the local population. The peasantry desperately desired the end of collective farms, but the factories remained in place, industry slowed down and food supplies were restricted to support the German war effort. During World War II, around 2.2 million Ukrainians were taken to Germany to be slaves. Their culture was restricted, and they were only allowed to go to school up to the primary level. The only Ukrainian organization that was allowed to continue working was the Orthodox Church. Ukrainians living in Galicia had a slightly better situation, with cultural activities, civic activities, and relief work being authorized under centralized management. Under the conditions of brutality, Ukrainian political activity originally based on collaboration with the Germans increasingly turned to underground organizational activity and resistance. In 1941, the groups of people who moved eastward were soon met with repressive measures from the German authorities. This included executions. Even though they were in danger, they continued to spread their nationalist views secretly and began to change their ideology to be more democratic and pluralist. In eastern and central Ukraine, underground communist party cells continued to exist under the German occupation, while a Soviet partisan movement arose in the northern woods. The formation of nationalist partisan units in Volhynia, later in Galicia, is known as the Ukrainian Insurgent Army, Ukrainska Povstanska Armia, or UPA. The Soviets and UPA guerrilla warfare was mixed with each other. After their epic victory over the Germans at Stalingrad in early 1943, the Soviets began a westward counterattack. At the start of 1943, the Germans began retreating from Ukraine, leaving devastation in their wake. The Soviets returned to Kyiv in November. As the Red Army advanced into western Ukraine, bloody clashes between Ukrainians and Poles intensified. In spring 1944, the Red Army finally succeeded in taking control of all of Ukraine. During World War II, the Red Army's occupation of Eastern Europe, and Allied diplomacy resulted in a permanent redrawing of Ukraine's western frontiers. Poland agreed to give up Volhynia and Galicia in exchange for German territories west of the new border, a mutual population exchange, and subsequent deportation of the remaining Ukrainian people by Poland to its new western territories, established for the first time in centuries a clear ethnic, as well as political, Polish-Ukrainian border. Transcarpathia was reoccupied by the Red Army in 1944 and it became part of Ukraine as part of the Paris Peace Treaty of 1947. After returning from Hungary to Czechoslovakia in 1944, Transcarpathia was transferred to Ukraine under a Czech-Soviet agreement in 1945. 
Ukraine signed peace treaties with Germany's wartime allies, Italy, Finland, Romania, Hungary, and Bulgaria, becoming a UN charter member in 1945. Ukraine suffered enormous losses during World War II. Some 5 to 7 million people died. Even with the return of people who had been evacuated and the repatriation of laborers who had been forced to work in Germany, Ukraine's population was almost 5 million less than it was before the war. Over the course of the Soviet Union's existence, famine resulted in the deaths of 12 million people. Only 20% of industrial firms and 15% of agricultural equipment and machinery were still intact, as well as a transportation network that was severely disrupted. The material losses accounted for about 40% of Ukraine's national wealth during this time period. During the last years of Stalin's rule, post-war reconstruction, the reimposition of totalitarian controls and terror, and the Sovietization of Western Ukraine were hallmarks. Immediately after they regained control over the recovered territories, Soviet authorities began economic reconstruction. The fourth five-year plan, like the 1930s. One before it, emphasized heavy industry over consumer need. By 1950, industrial production in Ukraine had surpassed that of the 1930s. However, agriculture's recovery was much more sluggish. Pre-war production levels weren't attained until the 1960s. Starting in 1946, as a consequence of post-war dislocation and drought, about one million people died of starvation. The pre-war system of totalitarian control was quickly reimposed. Khrushchev continued to head the Communist Party as first secretary, except for a brief time from March to December 1947, until his promotion to secretary of the Central Committee in Moscow in December 1949, he was succeeded by Leonid Melnikov. In the period immediately following, purge operations were moderate. However, real and accused Nazi collaborators, former German POWs and repatriated slave laborers, Ukrainian, bourgeois nationalists, and others thought to be disloyal, nearly a million people in all, were moved to concentration camps in the far north and Siberia. A hard-line ideological crusade to rid Ukraine of Western influences went hand-in-hand hand with a renewed push for Russification. Ukrainian writers, artists, and academics who had been allowed to express patriotic sentiments and themes in the war years as part of a mobilization effort against the Germans were now accused of Ukrainian nationalism and subjected to persecution and repression. The demolition of the remaining remnants of a Jewish community devastated by the Holocaust was called an anti-cosmopolitan campaign. The Sovietization of Western Ukraine was a drawn-out and bloody affair. The UPA, led by Roman Shukhevich in the 1940s, continued to fight the Red Army until the early 1950s. The local rural people, embittered by the simultaneous forced collectivization campaign, provided covert aid to the guerrillas. The Greek Catholic Church was also accused of aiding the partisans and Ukrainian nationalism in general. The enthronement of Metropolitan Yosef Slippy in the autumn of 1945 was met with widespread opposition. In April 1945, Slippy, along with the rest of Galicia's hierarchy, were arrested and sentenced to long imprisonment. Only Slippy survived, to be released in 1963 and sent into exile in Rome. A synod was held in Lviv, Ukraine, in March 1946, on Stalin's orders, to declare the reunification of the Ukrainian Greek Catholics with the Russian Orthodox Church. In 1949, the Greek Catholic Church in Transcarpathia was eliminated. The Greek Catholic Church was declared self-liquidated and kept a secret existence under Soviet domination. Overall, half a million Ukrainians were deported from Western Ukraine as part of the insurgency and nationalist activity suppression, religious persecution, and collectivization. After the death of Joseph Stalin in 1953, Nikita Khrushchev's rise to power over his rivals in Moscow was of great importance to Ukraine. As the first secretary of the CPBU, Nikita Khrushchev had extensive experience with Ukraine and appointed his own trusted people to party and government posts. In contrast to Stalin's anti-Ukrainian sentiment, Khrushchev had few quarrels with Ukrainians who followed the party line and gave their all to the Soviet state. In 1956, Melnikov was removed as CPU first secretary for deviations in nationality policy, notably promoting non-native cadres and Russification of higher education in Western Ukraine. The post of prime minister was filled by Oleksiy Kyrychenko, the nation's second prime minister. This and other personnel changes in the party and government boosted morale and optimism, especially as their area of competence was widened. In 1994, for example, Ukraine celebrated the 300th anniversary of its unification with Russia. Another indication of Ukrainians' rise in status was the nationwide celebrations of the 300th anniversary of Ukraine's union with Russia in 1954. On that day, Crimea, from which the indigenous Tatar people had been deported at the end of World War II, was transferred from the Russian SFSR to Ukraine. Many Ukrainian party officials were quickly given high ranks in Moscow's power centers. Kyrychenko was transferred to Moscow as a Central Committee Secretary in 1957, and Nikolai Podgorny took his place as CPU First Secretary. The number of party members increased steadily over the next two decades, 
by the end of 1958, it had risen to 1 million members, with 60.3% being Ukrainians and 28.2% Russians, more than 40% joined after the war. The first secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, began to decentralize government and economic management in 1957. These measures increased the authority and aspirations of Ukraine's party and government officials, as well as their bureaucracy. Moscow issued warnings against localism as a result of these changes, which enhanced authorities and ambitions of Ukrainian party and government leaders and bureaucracy. In terms of growth in industry, Ukraine's economy continued to recover at a rapid rate. Some things got better for consumers, but not everything changed. The government tried to make it easier for farmers to be productive, but that didn't work as well. After three years of mass terror, the intensity of state repression began to decline in 1953. In 1955, a general amnesty released the majority of concentration camp prisoners, but several hundred thousand Ukrainians were still held in prison for their political convictions. After Khrushchev's secret speech in 1956, which criticized Stalin, Ukrainian cultural elites became more bold in their demands for change. Some writers who had suffered under Stalin received praise and honors. People who had been condemned in the 1920s and 1930s were given a chance to be rehabilitated. Historians started to teach topics that had been forbidden before. Some banned books were republished, and new magazines started being published, including the first magazine since the 1930s devoted to Ukrainian history. Later in Khrushchev's reign, there was a trend of making Russia better. A change in schools happened in 1959 that made it. So there were less classes taught in Ukrainian. The 1961 party program stressed the need for Russian language preservation among Soviet peoples and spoke of the diminished significance of border differences between Soviet republics. The idea of fusion of nations, which would eventually lead to the loss of distinct national languages, was created by party theorists as Soviet society moved toward communism. In the late 1950s, small, secret dissident organizations began to form in Ukraine, primarily as discussion groups on political and cultural alternatives. Between 1958 and 1964, the state police discovered a dozen such organizations and incarcerated its members. In the absence of open opposition to the party line, Ukrainian language and culture were usually defended indirectly, through poetry extolling the mother tongue, complaints about the lack of Ukrainian language textbooks, and appeals for readership of Ukrainian periodicals. In the final years of Khrushchev's rule, two personalities rose to prominence, Petro Shellist and Volodymyr Sherbitsky, both of whom dominated Ukraine's political landscape for almost 30 years. Both had worked in local party organizations before entering national politics. In 1961 Sherbitsky was named chairman of the Council of Ministers, Premier, of Ukraine. In June 1963 Shellist succeeded him as party leader in Ukraine and simultaneously he resigned as premier. Power in Moscow was shared by a collective leadership from 1977 until the mid-1980s, when Leonid Brezhnev rose to preeminence. Shellist, Sherbitsky's disciple, became an official member of the Politburo after Khrushchev's fall. However, Sherbitsky quickly resurfaced from anonymity, he reclaimed the Kyiv premiership in 1965 and was named a prospective member of the Politburo in Moscow in 1966 thanks to Brezhnev. Despite the fact that the new leaders in Moscow swiftly reversed many of Khrushchev's decentralizing policies, at first they showed greater concern for non-Russians. The apparent retreat in Moscow's nationality policy, coupled with the leadership's concentration on the succession struggle, aided three major trends that characterize Ukraine's Shellist era, a rising cultural revival, increased political assertiveness in Kyiv, and a sizable dissident movement. The cultural rebirth was founded on the difficult, but necessarily partial, gains of the de-Stalinization thaw. It was led by a younger generation of the 60s, who, without having witnessed Stalin's reign of terror firsthand, experimented with themes and forms that sometimes provoked the ire of their elders. Ukrainian history was repackaged as a literary discipline and historians investigated previously forbidden themes. New periodicals and serials dedicated to Ukrainian history emerged, and massive encyclopedic works were published. The efforts of these people came under intense attack from communist ideologues and the traditional cultural establishment. Promised publications failed to appear, published works were withdrawn from circulation, and artwork was destroyed. Higher education plans drawn up by the Ukrainian government on a ministerial level for a partial Russification of learning institutions were never put into action. Even though the artistic accomplishments were unrivaled in comparison to the Ukrainization period in the 1920s, they were aided by prominent portions of the party leadership, notably Shellist himself. Shellist was an advocate for Ukraine's cultural heritage and opposed Soviet economic policies. Shellist pressured the USSR for a greater share of investment allocation and more Republican control over the economy. This was intended, in part, to improve Communist Party legitimacy among Ukrainians. Communist Party membership in Ukraine nearly doubled during Shellist's term, climbing to 2.5 million by 1971, almost double the all-union average. 
Shellist led the dissident movement from its inception in the late 1950s and early 1960s, when it was initially known as the First Force. It was previously called the Second Economy, and then under various guises. In 1965, 20 dissidents were arrested and tried for their beliefs. Vyacheslav Chornovil, the journalist who compiled these profiles, was also arrested and imprisoned. The national discontent movement got bigger and bigger after that. People sent letters and petitions to the authorities. They also formed clubs and discussion circles. People held public meetings and demonstrations too. Some of the dissidents' writings were published in other countries. Ivan Ziuba's Internationalism or Russification was translated into many languages and published. Throughout the 1960s, however, reprisals for dissident activity were generally mild. Since 1970, it was clear that the Shellist regime was coming to an end. The head of the KGB in Ukraine was replaced. The words anti-Soviet activities and bourgeois nationalism were used more frequently. A reference was made to the great Russian people. Sherbitsky, Brezhnev's protege and Shellist's opponent, was promoted to full Politburo member in 1971. In a period of severe government repression in Ukraine, several hundreds of dissidents and cultural campaigners were arrested in January to April 1972. Shellist was stripped of his position as party leader in Ukraine in May 1973, and he was replaced by Sherbitsky. Shellist remained a member of the Politburo and a deputy prime minister in Moscow for another year, but he was stripped of all party and government roles in May 1973. Sherbitsky's promotion marked an important step in the consolidation of power by Brezhnev in Moscow. Sherbitsky survived in office for 17 years until his resignation in 1989, a few weeks before his death. This was long after the death of Brezhnev and well into the tenure of Mikhail Gorbachev. Gradually after Sherbitsky became the head of the party and government, many personnel changes happened. Many of these changes involved removing Shellist supporters and promoting people who were associated with Sherbitsky's earlier career, in the Dnipropetrovsk Regional Communist Party organization. In October 1972, Valentin Malinchuk, who had previously engaged in political agitation in the highly politicized Lviv region, was appointed secretary for ideology. In 1973-75, almost 5% of CPU members were erased from party lists as a result of a purge. By the mid-1970s, Samvidev writers were writing almost all of their works in labor camps, and much of it was being sent abroad where it was published. In 1975, following the signing of the International Helsinki Accords with their human rights provisions, Ukraine's Helsinki Watch Group was established under the leadership of poet Mykola Rudenko. By the end of the decade, its members were almost all incarcerated or in exile abroad. Incarceration in psychiatric hospitals became a new technique of political oppression as the jail terms of imprisoned dissidents were more frequently followed by re-arrest and fresh sentences on criminal charges. The use of psychiatric institutions to imprison people has become increasingly common. The fall of Shellist led to a broad attack on Ukrainian culture and an intensification of Russification. Immediately after Shellist's fall, the circulation of the most popular Ukrainian periodicals was substantially reduced. Most new journals and serials started under Shellist's ceased publication. There was also a general decline in Ukrainian language publishing and education during Sherbitsky's tenure. Malinchuk oversaw a campaign of purges in Ukrainian academic and cultural institutions for two years after his appointment as Secretary for Ideology. Many academics, museums, publishers, and official organizations of writers, artists, and filmmakers were expelled from the Academy of Sciences, universities, editorial boards, and other organizations. Malinchuk's unexpected removal in 1979 did not have a big effect on the trend. This may have been done to make the angry cultural intelligentsia happy. They were needed for the upcoming celebrations of the 325th anniversary of reunification of Ukraine with Russia, that year and the 1500th anniversary of the founding of Kyiv in 1982. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, Ukraine's economy deteriorated rapidly. The rates of expansion decreased, as well as significant issues plagued especially the crucial ferrous metallurgy and coal mining industries. Droughts, a lack of incentives, and excessive centralization in collective farm management all hurt agricultural production. Soviet energy policy shifted increasingly to nuclear power in the 1980s, culminating in the April 1986 nuclear catastrophe at one of Ukraine's nuclear power plants at Chernobyl just northwest of Kyiv. Many people died right after the accident. Tens of thousands had to evacuate. Five million people were exposed to radiation, and hundreds of thousands received doses that could cause cancer in the future. Even though many years have passed, there are still more cases of thyroid cancer in the Chernobyl area than in other parts of the country. Despite this, Sherbitsky remained in office. Gorbachev's attempt to fix the Soviet Union's economic problems led to a rise in nationalism. People in the different republics were able to voice their concerns about their own countries, which hadn't been possible before. Ukraine's national revival gradually grew as people were allowed to talk about topics that had been forbidden for a long time. 
Starting in mid-1986, the Ukrainian press and media cautiously started to mention these topics. In 1987, people started to form unofficial groups in Kyiv and Lviv. In 1988, more people started to get involved and there were public demonstrations. The same thing happened in 1989, but this time it was more overt and people were getting organized. In the three years from 1987 to 1989, new leaders emerged in Ukrainian society. Many cultural activists who were prominent during the Shellist period, as well as former dissidents, took on new roles. The issues that concerned Ukrainians during this time included language, culture, and history. However, there was also a resurgence of interest in religion and new concerns about the economy and the environment. In the first years after independence, most of Ukraine's focus was on Russification and the dire state of the Ukrainian language in schools, publishing, and state administration. Data from the 1989 census verified people's growing concerns over long-term language trends. At the same time that Ukrainians were decreasing as a proportion of Ukraine's population, their attachment to Ukrainian as their native tongue had grown even faster. The debate over it came to a head with passage of a language law in fall 1989 that made Ukrainian an official state language for the first time. A campaign to fill in the blank spots, in history aimed to restore public awareness of neglected or suppressed historical events and figures such as Hetman Ivan Mazipa, to rehabilitate historians such as Mihailo Rushevsky, and to republish banned works of pre-Soviet historical scholarship. Particularly intense were efforts to introduce knowledge of the Stalin period, especially the Great Famine of 1932, which became labeled the Ukrainian Genocide. Fresh revelations appeared in the press about mass graves of political prisoners executed in the Stalin era. To honor the victims of Stalinism and to promote investigations of the repressions and famine of the 1930s, the All-Ukrainian Memorial Society was founded in March 1989 based on already existing local groups. A religious revival was also taking place in 1988, greatly stimulated by celebrations of a thousand years of Christianity in Kiev and Rus. Lavish government-supported Russian Orthodox ceremonies in Moscow were counted with unofficial celebrations throughout Ukraine, including open observances by the prescribed Greek Catholics. As bishops and clergy who had been living underground came out into the open, the demand grew for the re-legalization of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. In 1989, many clergy and congregations defected from Russian Orthodoxy and began to seek official registration for the Greek Catholic Church. Concurrently, in February 1989, an initiative group was formed to restore the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church. After revelations about the scale of the Chernobyl disaster and mounting evidence of official wrongdoing in its aftermath, many people became concerned about the environment in Ukraine. This led to a widespread ecological movement. Scientists and writers worked together to create environmental groups all over the world. In December of 1987, these groups came together to form a national organization called Zelini Svit. This group was led by writer Yuri Shabak. In the Donbas region of Ukraine, the traditionally passive industrial workers became organized. This was in response to years of neglect by Moscow, which resulted in a steady deterioration of the coal mining industry and increasingly hazardous working conditions in the mines. Complaints from miners began appearing in 1985. But it wasn't until 1989 that a spontaneous movement by miners in Donbas led to a strike. The concessions made by Moscow were not enough to stop the growing sense of alienation. The miners, who were mainly Russian-speaking, began to be drawn to the Ukrainian national movement because they felt it was better equipped to defend their interests in confrontation with Moscow. In March 1988, the first major organization with a clearly political goal emerged. This was the Ukrainian Helsinki Union, which was established by imprisoned politicians who had previously belonged to the Helsinki Watch Group in the mid-1970s. The Helsinki Union was created with the goal of restoring Ukraine's sovereignty and ensuring the rights of its people. The union was led by Levko Lukinenko and Vyacheslav Chornovil. By 1989, there were branches of the union in all regions of Ukraine. The CPU fought the National Rebirth and Autonomous Self-Organization at every turn, which it opposed with unreconstructed Republican Communist Party organizations. The opposition to the rising democratic forces in Ukraine took the form of propaganda attacks from the press and media, intimidation, harassment, and occasional arrests. Sherbitsky continued firmly in charge of the CPU, in a sign of Moscow's fear of destabilization in Ukraine. Nevertheless, the official policies of Perestroika and Glasnost inhibited more extreme measures, while the example of rapid change in other republics, especially the Baltics, emboldened democratic Ukrainian activists. In 1989, Ukraine's society changed from social mobilization to mass politicization. The Congress of People's Deputies in Moscow elected a large number of non-communist candidates in elections for a new supreme legislative body. Many communist party candidates lost their elections, including high-ranking officials. This was especially humiliating when they were running unopposed. If an unopposed candidate didn't get more than 50% of the vote, the election was considered void and that candidate couldn't run for office again. 
This made the party lose confidence and led to more resignations. In January of 1989, writers in Ukraine tried to create a popular front. This front would agree with the policies of Gorbachev, particularly perestroika. However, the CPU was not happy with this idea and created hostility towards the front. Ruck advocated for democracy and human rights. The founding Congress was in September and they elected a leadership. Poet Ivan Drak was the head of the leadership. In September 1989, Sherbitsky resigned from his position as first secretary of the CPU. His successor, Volodymyr Ivashko, praised him for his work but also said that the CPU needed to take into account new political realities. These realities included a rapid institutionalization of national, civic, and religious life that outpaced legal recognition. The most important event of 1990 was the introduction of parliamentary democracy. On March 4, the first competitive elections to the Ukrainian parliament, which replaced the old-style Supreme Soviet, were held, breaking the Communist Party's grip on political power in Ukraine for good. The parliament that met in mid-May included a lot of Democrats. A few communists changed their minds on specific issues, which reduced the CPU's majority to 239 of the 450 members. The political leadership in Ukraine changed rapidly. The parliament elected a new secretary for ideology, Leonid Kravchuk. On July 16, the parliament claimed sovereignty for Ukraine. This meant that the people of Ukraine could make decisions without regard to nationality or ethnicity. The declaration marked the start of a gradual convergence of views between the communist majority and the democratic opposition. Their agenda was increasingly adopted by Kravchuk, who was becoming more pragmatic. Gorbachev, when faced with rising nationalism, had already proposed a new union treaty that would give broad autonomy to the Soviet republics while still keeping central control over things like foreign policy, the military, and the financial system. To prevent the cession of newly claimed sovereign rights to Moscow, student-led mass demonstrations and a hunger strike took place in Kyiv in October 1990, with the protests resulting in concessions including the resignation of the prime minister. In that month, Ruck, which was gaining in popularity, announced as its ultimate aim Ukraine's complete independence. Only Gorbachev's proposals for a new union treaty were supported by CPU. In 1991, some hardline members of Gorbachev's government in Moscow organized a coup. This failed within two days. After the coup, the Ukrainian parliament declared full independence from the Soviet Union on August 24. This declaration was provisional, and would only take effect if it was approved by a referendum on December 1 Street. In the referendum of December 1, 1991, the population of Ukraine voted overwhelmingly in favor of independence. 84% of eligible voters turned out, and 90% of them endorsed independence. By the time Kravchuk was elected president in an election that coincided with the referendum, several significant changes had occurred in Ukraine, including the Communist Party's dissolution and, under Minister of Defense Kostyantin Morozov, the creation of infrastructure for a Ukrainian armed force. Ukraine also resisted pressure from Moscow to reconsider its course toward independence and enter into a restructured Soviet Union. A week after the independence referendum, the leaders of Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus agreed to establish the Commonwealth of Independent States, CIS. Shortly thereafter the USSR was formally disbanded. Ukraine was once considered the best chance among the former Soviet republics of achieving economic growth and integration with Europe as a whole after the Soviet Union's collapse. However, by the end of the 20th century, the Ukrainian economy had weakened significantly. This caused social and political change to fall short of transforming Ukraine into a completely European state. Ukraine made some important progress in this time period. It became more independent and developed its state structure. It also improved relations with neighboring countries, although there were some disagreements. Ukraine also began the process of becoming a democracy, and was accepted as a member of the international community. At the time, President Kravchuk's top priority was state creation. Ukraine's armed forces and basic infrastructure of an independent country were rapidly established during his administration. Ukraine became a country with citizenship extended to all people, regardless of ethnicity or language. It received international recognition and developed its own diplomatic service. The pro-Western foreign policy was introduced, and statements stressed that Ukraine was a European, rather than an Eurasian, nation. The post-World War. I Ukrainian National Republic state symbols and national anthem were restored. The nature of Ukraine's participation in the Commonwealth, nuclear disarmament, the status of Crimea, and control of the Black Sea Fleet and its port city of Sevastopol were all contentious issues that severely strained the newborn state. While these issues inflamed passions on both sides of the border, they also helped to define Ukraine's new relationship with Russia. Ukrainian leaders regarded the CIS as little more than a loose confederation of former Soviet republics, with the intention of assisting in a civilized divorce from the Union. In contrast, Russia saw it as an opportunity to preserve some level of regional cooperation, under Moscow's political dominance, and set out to create it as a supranational organization that would succeed the USSR. 
At the meeting that established the CIS, these opposing viewpoints were not obvious, but they soon became apparent. As Ukraine rejected proposals for a CIS army under unified command, a single CIS citizenship, and the protection of external rather than national frontiers, Russo-Ukrainian disputes emerged. Ukraine's parliament voted to join the CIS Interparliamentary Assembly in March 1999, opting for only an associate membership after more than seven years of independence with the CIS no longer. A real threat to Ukraine's sovereignty. The question of nuclear disarmament proved to be a thorny problem. Following the Chernobyl catastrophe, anti-nuclear feeling was widespread in Ukraine. Ukrainian leaders had even previously vowed to get rid of nukes. Throughout this period, Ukrainians were not aware of the size of their nuclear arsenal. Ukraine was effectively the third largest nuclear power in the world at the time, nor had they considered the high costs and logistical issues of nuclear disarmament. The leaders of independent Ukraine began to question the wisdom of giving all of Ukraine's weapons to a potential adversary that was now claiming portions of Ukraine's territory such as Crimea after approximately half of the arsenal had been sent to Russia early in 1992. The regime's complaints about the US Department of State's allegations were once more present in its official statement following the UN meeting. Ukraine then expressed reservations about removing all of the weapons from its territory before it could receive certain assurances for its safety and financial compensation for dismantling and transporting them. The apparent U-turn caused a stir in Western nations, particularly in the United States. The press in the Western world began to cast Ukraine as a renegade state. Finally, in May 1992, Ukraine signed the Lisbon Protocol, which obligated it to start short for strategic arms reduction talks. The United States brokered subsequent talks, which resulted in a trilateral agreement between the United States, Russia, and Ukraine in January 1994 that outlined a timetable for disarmament and addressed financial and security concerns raised by Ukraine. The problems of Crimea, Sevastopol, and the Black Sea Fleet were not only Ukraine's most contentious post-independence issue but also represented a serious risk to regional stability. In 1954, the Russian SFSR surrendered administration of Crimea to the Ukrainian SS on condition that it would be administered by Ukraine in perpetuity as part of Russia's terms for Soviet acceptance into the Warsaw Pact military alliance. However, it was the one area of Ukraine where ethnic Russians were in the majority. In 1991 Crimea was granted autonomous republic status and voted in favor of Ukrainian independence, though by a narrow margin. A popular movement for greater autonomy or, eventually, secession took hold in the peninsula. The separatists were bolstered in their efforts by frequent declarations by high-ranking Russian politicians and the Russian government that Crimea was an ancient province of Russia that should never have been incorporated into Ukraine. The situation was made more difficult by the return of around 250,000 Crimean Tatars to the peninsula, many after having been deported at the end of World War II, starting in the late 1980s. 1994 was a year of increasing tension in the region. Separatist leader Yuri Meshkov was elected Crimean president in January, and a referendum on sovereignty was held two months later. Despite his shortcomings, however, Meshkov proved to be an ineffective leader, alienating his own supporters in no time. On September 6, 1994, he was deposed and imprisoned by the parliament in Simferopol. The parliament eventually removed Meshkov's authority and installed a pro-Kiev prime minister. Ukraine terminated the office of Crimean president in March 1995 and imposed direct political rule over the region although it provided significant economic advantages. The Crimean separatist movement came to an end. The dispute between Ukraine and Russia over the Black Sea Fleet's control and Sevastopol, a Crimean port city where the fleet was based, was particularly heated. Ukraine made a formal claim to the entire fleet in March 1992, which had been a valuable naval asset of the Soviet Union. Russia responded promptly that the fleet had always been and would continue to be Russian property. The dispute over it was referred to as a war of decrees until June 1992, when Kravchuk and Russian President Boris Yeltsin reached an agreement on its resolution at the Black Sea Summit in Yalta, Crimea. Boris Yeltsin confirmed that the fleet would be operated jointly for three years. Subsequently, a deal was reached to split the fleet's assets equally, but after further bargaining, Ukraine agreed to give Russia control of a majority of the fleet in return for debt forgiveness. The basing rights issue was not resolved until a comprehensive agreement on the Black Sea Fleet was reached in 1997. It permitted Russia to rent out the main port facilities of Sevastopol for 20 years. Ukraine and Russia quickly signed the Treaty of Friendship, Cooperation, and Partnership, 1997, which recognized Ukraine's territorial sovereignty and prior borders, including Crimea, as well as established certain ties. Given Ukraine's abrupt and fundamental shift from the Soviet Union, it was only a matter of time before the cordial relations with Russia deteriorated. Because Ukraine was treated as an integral part of the Russian domain, Russia had great difficulty in recognizing, much less accepting, Ukrainians as independent nation-state individuals. As a result, Russia reacted more strongly to Ukraine's exit than it did to the breakup of the other Soviet republics. 
On the other hand, Ukraine was sensitive to any sign of Russian encroachment on its sovereignty, which heightened tension between the two countries up until around 2010. Into the early 21st century, ties between them were still tumultuous. The dependence of Ukraine on Russia for fossil fuels was a cause for worry. After claiming that Ukraine had not paid its bills, Russia cut off its natural gas supply to Ukraine in 2006. Nonetheless, according to Ukraine, the cut was retaliation for its pro-Western policies. The relationship between Ukraine and its neighbors was typically more pleasant. Hungary has had a long history of friendship with Ukraine. Poland, on the other hand, was firmly in favor of Ukrainian sovereignty, despite previous centuries of conflict. By co-founding a semi-loose sub-regional organization called Guam, Ukraine also fostered ties with several former Soviet republics. Romania's claims to certain Ukrainian territories such as northern Bukovina and southern Bessarabia, as well as Serpent Island and its adjacent seas in the Black Sea, made for difficult ties with Ukraine. Belarus' authoritarian political system and planned two-state union with Russia made close relations with Ukraine seem unlikely. Ukraine's relations with the United States have been rocky from the beginning. During a tour of Ukraine in the summer of 1991, President George Bush offended many Ukrainians by warning them against suicidal nationalism and urging them to stay inside the USSR. The end of the Cold War in 1991 resulted in an increase of global tensions, highlighted by the breakup of the Soviet Union. Washington became seriously concerned about Ukraine's large nuclear arsenal at this time. Significant ties began to develop only after the disarmament issue was resolved. Ukraine soon developed into a significant recipient of U.S. foreign aid, and the two nations established a solid political relationship as a result. Since gaining independence in 1991, Ukraine's economic performance, in stark contrast to its successful efforts at state creation and diplomacy, has been abysmal. The social upheaval caused by Russia's economic shock therapy dampened the Ukrainian government's enthusiasm for rapid change. Rather than pursuing a fast transformation, it opted for a gradualist strategy. Ukraine's economy went into a tailspin as it tried to recover from the disruption of trade with former Soviet republics caused by the breakup of the USSR. As a result, Ukraine's heavy dependence on foreign energy sources and Russia's decision to raise the previously subsidized price of fossil fuels worldwide has placed significant strain on the economy, particularly because Ukraine is still dependent on Russian energy. Ukraine's economy was devastated by hyperinflation in 1993, which reached a rate of at least 4,735%. Meanwhile, corruption worsened as political insiders stole state assets for themselves or took unfair advantage of low-interest loans available to industry and agriculture. Leonid Kuchma's appointment as prime minister in October 1992 was the result of a long-term economic reform effort. His efforts, however, were strongly opposed by a majority of MPs, and, to some degree, undercut by President Kravchuk himself. In 1993, a frustrated Kuchma resigned. After Ukraine gained its independence, the country experienced a number of significant advances. The media became considerably more open and vibrant, although those who were too openly critical of the government were harassed, notably during Kuchma's term in office from 1994 to 2005. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, academic and intellectual life was liberated. As a result, a growing collection of publications emerged and liberal arts and business schools began to develop. Religious life blossomed as the Ukrainian Orthodox and Ukrainian Catholic churches, as well as other denominations, were able to function freely. In addition, a new generation of young people grew up free from Soviet ideological and intellectual restrictions. In the post-independence period, interactions with minorities were generally peaceful. The Jewish community experienced a rebirth in the United States, with American-born chief rabbi of Kiev Yaakov Dov Bleik playing an important part in establishing synagogues, schools, and charitable efforts. Furthermore, the Ukrainian government sought to foster a good relationship with the Jewish people openly. In western Ukraine, the Hungarians and Romanians were given nationality status, and the government made some efforts to help the Tatars, whose hundreds of thousands still lived abroad as a result of massive deportations in the 1940s. Because of Mustafa Jemilev's strong leadership, Tatar unrest was kept under control during the post-independence era. In the years that followed Ukraine's 1991 independence, the country's minority Russian population found itself in an uncertain position. As part of the dominant nationality within the USSR, it had maintained a psychological majority status in Soviet Ukraine, according to some commentators. Russian status in independent Ukraine, on the other hand, was less certain. Although this was never an issue, many Ukrainians of Russian descent were unhappy that Russian was not recognized as the country's second official language. The highly partisan issue was resolved in part in 2012, when a new legislation extended regional officials' powers to grant official status to minority languages. Even in places with a significant Russian population, the gradual Ukrainization of the educational system has not been well received. The issue was made more difficult by Russia's promise to protect ethnic Russians' rights in what it calls the near abroad, which includes Ukraine. 
Ukraine has long been plagued by a variety of social problems since gaining independence. Street crime and organized crime rose, and Ukraine became an important transit route for the international illegal drug trade. A frightening increase in the number of people infected with HIV and a steep rise in drug addicts was observed at this time. The international sex trade, which involved Ukrainian women, became an issue, as proven by the fact that Ukraine was the first former Soviet republic to establish an office of La Strada International, a network of organizations that worked to prevent human trafficking. The birth rate plummeted, especially among men, and illnesses that had long been eradicated, such as cholera, were reported. Many people, particularly the elderly, became trapped in squalid poverty, and many more sought work outside Ukraine both lawfully and illegally as migrant laborers. In Ukraine, parliamentary and presidential elections were held in 1994. The re-emergence of the Communist Party resulted in its members claiming about one-fifth of the seats in the first election. The left, which included the Socialist and Agrarian Party's deputies, now formed a powerful, although not completely unified, bloc in parliament. In the presidential election, incumbent President Kravchuk narrowly lost to former Prime Minister Kuchma, who promised economic change and improved relations with Russia. The two elections appeared to show a divide between eastern and western Ukraine in terms of politics. Kuchma and the left received their most backing from eastern Ukraine's more industrialized, Russophone areas, whereas Kravchuk thrived particularly in western Ukraine, where Ukrainians were the majority and National Democrats dominated. Nonetheless, the few number of irregularities in the election and the peaceful replacement of the president were taken as indications that democracy was flourishing in Ukraine. Kuchma continued many of Leonid Kravchuk's policies after taking office. He did not, however, reorient Ukraine's foreign policy toward Russia while seeking to improve relations. Ukraine remained a member of the CIS, albeit with altered status. Furthermore, Kuchma maintained Ukraine's pro-Western sentiments and aspirations. In 1994 Ukraine became a member of the Partnership for Peace program, which is administered by NATO which stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. In 1996, Ukraine established a special partnership with the organization. In 1995, Ukraine joined the Council of Europe. In the context of a threatening freedom deficit, Ukraine's president, Leonid Kuchma, confronted a major challenge in managing a robust parliamentary opposition, particularly in terms of economic reform. By 1996, when Ukraine implemented its long-awaited currency, the Harivnia, it had achieved macroeconomic stability. Despite these difficulties, the economy continued to underperform throughout the 1990s. Business was overly regulated and rife with corruption due of cumbersome bureaucratic processes and unenforced economic laws. In addition, the nation was able to attract only a restricted number of foreign investment. Ukraine's economy suffered during the Russian economic crisis of 1998. However, tax reform measures introduced in 1999 resulted in an increase in the number of small private firms starting or emerging from Ukraine's large shadow economy at that time. The legitimate sector began to expand at the turn of the 21st century. In the 1998 parliamentary election, the Communist Party made significant gains. Kuchma, however, defeated Communist Party leader Petro Simonenko by a wide margin in the 1999 presidential election. Kuchma had a lot to gain politically as the left split into several candidates. He also campaigned hard, using every opportunity at his disposal, including the media. In fact, it became clear in election TV coverage that a strong pro-Kuchma bias existed. International election monitors criticized Kuchma's management of the media and some blatant electoral abnormalities, although his margin of victory indicated that these factors alone had not determined the outcome. The results of the 1999 election were significant in two ways. The first is that they represented a rejection of the communist past. It was said to be a second referendum on independence. Second, the election did not split neatly along political lines, indicating that, for the time being, at least, the East-West division seen in the 1994 elections was not in a significant consideration in Ukrainian politics as many experts had assumed. During Kuchma's second term, there were conflicts between right and left-wing forces. This sometimes threatened political stability. However, newly appointed Prime Minister Viktor Yushchenko was able to shepherd economic reforms through the legislature. The economy expanded gradually throughout the first decade of the 21st century, but Ukraine's geopolitical situation remained nervous as it waited for NATO and EU membership while also striving for closer ties with Russia, an impossible balancing act. In 2003 Ukraine agreed in principle to establish a joint economic zone with Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. However, Russian accusations of worsening conditions for the Russian minority in Ukraine, as well as Ukrainian worries about what it perceived to be Russian expansionist ambitions in Crimea, strained Ukrainian-Russian ties. Following his ouster as prime minister in 2001, Yushchenko became an opposition leader. In 2002, audio recordings purportedly showed Kuchma's approval of the sale of a radar system to Iraq, 
which was in violation of a UN Security Council resolution, and implicated him in the assassination of a dissident journalist that year. Kuchma was impeached on allegations that he violated a UN Security Council resolution and ordered the murder of a political opponent. The presidential election of 2004 threatened to spin Ukraine apart and plunge the country into civil war. Kuchma was authorized by the Constitutional Court to seek a third term as president, but he instead backed Yanukovych, who received strong backing from Russian President Vladimir Putin. Yushchenko, a former presidential candidate who ran on an anti-corruption and anti-corruption ticket, emerged as the main opposition figure, but his campaign was prevented from visiting Yanukovych's stronghold of Donetsk and other eastern cities. In September Yushchenko's health began to deteriorate, and medical testing eventually revealed he had been poisoned with dioxin, allegedly administered by the Ukrainian State Security Service, leaving his face deformed. On October 31, Yushchenko and Yanukovych both received about a fifth of the vote in the initial round of presidential election. On November 29, Yanukovych was declared the winner of the runoff despite allegations of fraud from Yushchenko's supporters, who staged mass demonstrations that became known as the Orange Revolution. On December 1, 2004, President Leonid Kuchma of Ukraine called for early parliamentary elections to be held in January 2005. Orange-clad protesters took to the streets in response, and the country was plagued by nearly two weeks of demonstrations. If the results were invalidated, Yanukovych's supporters in the East threatened to secede from Ukraine. On December 3, however, the Supreme Court ruled that Yushchenko's election was illegal and ordered a new runoff for December 26. Yushchenko subsequently won re-election over Yanukovych with about 52% of the vote. Although Yanukovych challenged the legitimacy of the figures, he was sworn in as president on January 23, 2005. The early years of Yushchenko's term were marred by political upheaval. His first cabinet served for only until September 2005, when he dismissed all of his ministers, including Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko, a fellow Orange Revolution leader. The next Prime Minister, Yuri Yekarnurov, lasted just until January 2006. Our Ukraine finished third in parliamentary elections that took place soon thereafter, behind Yanukovych's Party of Regions and the Yulia Tymoshenko bloc. After a proposed collaboration of the so-called Orange parties in Parliament fell through, Yushchenko was compelled to accept Yanukovych as Prime Minister. The President's power struggle with the Prime Minister, whose political position had been enhanced by a constitutional reform that took effect in 2006, resulted in Yushchenko calling for new parliamentary elections in 2007. Once again, the President's party finished behind both Yanukovych's and Tymoshenko's parties. However, this time a coalition with the Yulia Tymoshenko bloc held together, allowing the pro-Western Orange parties to form a government with Tymoshenko as Prime Minister. As the government continued to balance the often conflicting goals of maintaining positive relations with Russia and gaining membership in the EU, dissent between Yushchenko and Tymoshenko contributed to their coalition breaking apart in September 2008. In October, the president dissolved parliament. Later, parliamentary elections were cancelled and Yushchenko's and Tymoshenko's parties agreed to form a new coalition together with the smaller Lightvin bloc, headed by Volodymyr Lightvin. In the next presidential election, which was held on January 17, 2010, President Yushchenko didn't do very well. He only got about 5% of the vote. The two top candidates were Yanukovych and Tymoshenko. They both got about 35% and 25%, respectively. Neither of them had won a majority of votes, so a runoff poll was held on February 7. The runoff results were split largely along regional lines, with most of western Ukraine supporting Tymoshenko and most of the east favoring Yanukovych. In the end, Yanukovych won with 48.95% of the vote, just a hair over Tymoshenko's 45.47%. Even though international observers said the election was fair, Tymoshenko said that the results were fake and refused to recognize Yanukovych's victory. She and her supporters did not attend his inauguration on February 25. The next week, Tymoshenko's government was overthrown in a vote of no confidence. Mykola Azarov from the Party of Regions became the new prime minister. Later in 2010, President Yanukovych gained more authority when the Constitutional Court overturned a 2006 reform that had given more power to the prime minister. In April 2010, following a debate in parliament, Ukraine agreed to let Russia have the port at Sevastopol for longer. The new lease would last until 2042. In return, Ukraine would get a discount on Russian natural gas. In June 2010, the Ukrainian government improved relations with Russia by officially abandoning its goal of joining NATO. However, this decision was met with some concern from EU leaders about the rule of law in Ukraine. In 2011, former Prime Minister Tymoshenko was convicted of abuse of power in connection with a 2009 natural gas deal with Russia. She was given a seven-year prison sentence. Yuri Lutsenko was convicted of abusing power in February 2012. Many people believed that this was a politically motivated decision. 
Ukraine co-hosted the UEFA European Championship Football, Soccer, tournament in the summer of 2012. Some European Union countries boycotted the event because of their concern for Timoshenko. In the parliamentary election in October 2012, the Party of Regions won the most seats with 185. Fatherland came in second with 101 seats, followed by Ukrainian Democratic Alliance for Reforms, UDAR, with 40 and Svoboda, Freedom, with 37. Timoshenko launched a hunger strike in protest of the poll's validity. Although several competitions were criticized for irregularities by international monitors, the European Parliament deemed the election to be relatively fair, and major opposition parties accepted the results. Azarov formed a government with communist and independent deputies in December 2012, on the promise of pardoning Lutsenko. In April 2013, Yanukovych showed his goodwill towards Europe by releasing Lutsenko from prison and appointing him economy minister. In November 2013, Ukraine's European path was abruptly halted when the country's planned association agreement with the EU was abandoned just days before it was supposed to be signed. Yanukovych agreed to sign a trade agreement with the EU on January 21, 2014, in order to avoid greater economic damage. The deal would have further tied political and economic ties between the EU and Ukraine, but Yanukovych succumbed to intense pressure from Moscow. Protests erupted in Kyiv, with Lutsenko and Klitschko emerging as the leaders of the largest demonstrations since the Orange Revolution. In December, police violently dispersed crowds in Kyiv's Independence Square, and as the demonstrations drew on into the new year, protesters took over Kyiv's city hall and urged Yanukovych to step down. In an effort to save the crumbling economy, Russia offered to reduce natural gas prices by a third and buy $15 billion in Ukrainian bonds. As protests turned into riots in January 2014, Yanukovych signed a series of laws that restricted the right to protest. This caused hundreds of thousands of people to take to the streets in response. Clashes erupted between police and protesters, with dozens of people injured on each side. On January 22, two protesters were killed in skirmishes with the police. The demonstration soon spread to eastern Ukraine, a region that traditionally supported Yanukovych and closer ties with Russia. People protesting at the Justice Ministry in Kyiv were met with resistance from the government. In response, the parliament repealed anti-protest measures. As talks continued between Yanukovych and opposition leaders, Azarov tendered his resignation as prime minister. In February, many people who were protesting were set free from jail as part of an amnesty deal. This agreement led to the evacuation of demonstrators from government buildings. However, the truce between the protesters and the government did not last long. Opposition parliamentarians tried to limit the power of the presidency, but they were not successful. The fighting in the streets turned deadly soon afterwards. On February 18, as many as 3,300 people were killed and over 6,000 injured in Kiev's Maidan when government troops tried to retake the square. The remaining 25,000 demonstrators built bonfires around their camp to defend against a second attack. Protesters in Lviv and Ivano Frankisk seized government offices in western Ukraine while EU officials threatened economic measures against Ukraine unless the Yanukovych administration took action to stop the bloodshed. The proposed truce did not happen, and on February 20 violence in Kyiv got worse. Police and government security forces shot at crowds of protesters. Many people were killed and injured. European Union leaders kept their promise to enact sanctions against Ukraine. Central government control continued to decrease in western Ukraine, as opposition forces occupied police stations and government offices in Lusk, Uzhorod, and Ternopil. The bloodiest week in Ukraine's post-Soviet history came to an end on February 21, when Yanukovych and opposition leaders signed an EU-brokered deal calling for snap elections and the formation of a national unity government. The parliament responded by approving the restoration of the 2004 constitution, which reduces the power of the presidency. In subsequent votes, the parliament approved a measure granting amnesty to protesters, fired Internal Affairs Minister Vitaly Zakharchenko for his role in ordering the crackdown on the Maidan, and decriminalized elements of the legal code under which Timoshenko had been prosecuted. The president's power base evaporating, Viktor Yanukovych fled the capital ahead of a vote to impeach him as head of state. Meanwhile, while still incarcerated, Yulia Timoshenko made her way to Kyiv and addressed the crowd gathered in the Maidan. Oleksandr Turchinov was appointed acting president after Yanukovych resigned. Yanukovych said that this was a coup and he was not happy with it. The interim government said that Yanukovych was responsible for the deaths of the people on Maidan and they issued a warrant for his arrest. Before the Maidan protests, the Ukrainian economy was struggling. After the protests, things got even worse because of all the change. People stopped trusting the government, and the hryvnia, the Ukrainian currency, fell to record lows. Credit rating agencies lowered Ukraine's debt ratings, and the International Monetary Fund tried to calm everything down. After the interim Ukrainian government installed fatherland leader Arseniy Yatsenyuk as prime minister, early presidential elections were scheduled for May 2014. 
However, on February 28, Yanukovych resurfaced in Rostov na Donu, Russia and delivered a defiant speech insisting he was still the rightful president of Ukraine. As pro-Russian protesters became more aggressive in Crimea, groups of armed men whose uniforms lacked any clear marking surrounded the airports in Simferopol and Sevastopol. Masked gunmen occupied the Crimean parliament building and raised a Russian flag, as pro-Russian lawmakers dismissed the sitting government and installed Sergei Aksionov, the leader of the Russian Unity Party, as Crimea's prime minister. Russian authorities acknowledged that they had moved troops into the Crimean region of Ukraine. This move provoked criticism from the Ukrainian prime minister, who characterized it as a violation of Ukrainian sovereignty. The Russian president defended the move, saying it was necessary to protect Russian citizens and military assets in Crimea. The leader of Crimea then declared that he, and not the government in Kyiv, was in command of Ukrainian police and military forces in Crimea. On March 6, the Crimean parliament voted to leave Ukraine and become part of Russia. A referendum on the matter was scheduled for March 16. The move was praised by Russia and condemned by most of the Western world. However, Kyiv affirmed that Crimea is an integral part of Ukraine. On the day of the referendum, many people noted that the voting process was not fair. There were armed men at polling stations, and the result was that 97% of people voted to join Russia. The interim government in Kyiv did not agree with the result, and so the United States and the EU put sanctions on many Russian officials and members of the Crimean parliament. On March 18, Putin met with Ixianov and other regional representatives. They signed a treaty incorporating Crimea into the Russian Federation. Western governments protested the move. Shortly after the treaty was signed, gunmen stormed a Ukrainian military base outside Simferopol and killed a Ukrainian soldier. Troops from the Russian Federation began to occupy bases on the peninsula, including Ukraine's navy headquarters in Sevastopol, as Ukraine began removing some 25,000 military personnel and their families from Crimea. On March 21, after the annexation agreement was approved by the Russian parliament, Putin signed a bill that defined Crimea's incorporation into Russia in formal terms. As international attention focused on Crimea, Yatsenyuk negotiated with the IMF to craft a bailout package that would address Ukraine's $35 billion in unmet financial obligations. He also met with EU officials in Brussels, and on March 21 Yatsenyuk signed a portion of the association pact that had been rejected by Yanukovych in November 2013. The IMF proposed an $18 billion loan to Ukraine, but it was contingent on the country adopting a range of austerity measures. These measures included devaluing the Harivnia and reducing state subsidies. Russia has solidified its grip on Crimea and renounced the 2010 treaty that extended its lease at the port of Sevastopol in return for a natural gas discount. In a matter of weeks, Russia's price for natural gas to Ukraine rose by 80%. While Russia openly put economic pressure on the interim government in Kyiv, Russian officials publicly stated that they did not have any more designs on Ukrainian territory. However, in early April, our NATO press briefing revealed the presence of an estimated 40,000 Russian troops, who were massed in a state of high readiness just across Ukraine's border. Then, in February 2014, a pro-Russian militia seized government buildings in the eastern Ukrainian cities of Donetsk, Luhansk, Horlivka, and Kramatorsk. In Kharkiv, local gunmen mistook an opera house for City Hall. In Crimea and other places, Russian soldiers took over buildings without any identification. They did this with a lot of precision and planning. In Slavyansk there was a gun battle when pro-Russian people tried to do the same thing. Turchinov imposed a deadline on the protesters, offering them immunity from prosecution if they surrendered but threatening a military strike if they did not. The deadline passed without any problems. The occupiers kept their gains, and Turchinov asked the United Nations to send peacekeeping forces to eastern Ukraine to restore order. Meanwhile, he indicated his support for one of the pro-Russian camp's most important demands, a public referendum on Ukraine's federalization. On April 15, the Ukrainian military successfully reclaimed the airfield at Kramatorsk, but a more comprehensive effort to regain control in Slavyansk the next day failed badly when Ukrainian troops handed over six armored personnel carriers to pro-Russian militants. In Mariupol, meanwhile, Ukrainian soldiers battled pro-Russian militants and repelled an assault that left several militiamen dead. However, despite all of the parties' stated intentions to resolve the Ukraine crisis, Russia began military exercises on its side of the border and pro-Russian militants expanded their area of control seizing more government buildings and establishing armed checkpoints. In early April, Volodymyr Rybak, a city council representative from Horlivka and a member of Timoshenko's Fatherland Party, was kidnapped and murdered by pro-Russian fighters. Subsequently, dozens of people, including eight members of an OSCE monitoring team, have been kidnapped and detained by pro-Russian militants. Gennady Kearns, the mayor of Kharkiv and a member of Viktor Yanukovych's party of regions who had reversed his pro-Moscow position and declared his support for a united Ukraine, was shot in the stomach by a sniper during a fresh round of US and EU sanctions against Russia. 
On May 2, the Ukrainian government started fighting against pro-Russian forces in Slavyansk. Two helicopters were lost in the fight, but the Ukrainian president said that many separatists had been killed or arrested. That same day, violence erupted in Odessa and dozens of pro-Russian demonstrators were killed when the building they occupied caught fire. On May 9, Putin visited Crimea and reviewed Russia's Black Sea Fleet to commemorate Victory Day, which commemorates the Soviet victory over Nazi Germany in World War II. Before Putin's trip, the Council for Civil Society and Human Rights, a Kremlin-sponsored advisory group, issued a warning about Crimea that deviated significantly from the stated results of the March 16 independence vote. Approximately 30-50% to 50 of people voted in the referendum. More than half of those who voted chose annexation by Russia. As self-declared separatist governments in Luhansk and Donetsk prepared to stage their own referenda on independence, Ukrainian security forces continued to contest territory with pro-Russian militias, and a particularly bloody clash in Mariupol left as many as 20 dead. On May 11, separatists in controlled cities held referenda that were quickly condemned by Kyiv as a farce. Widespread irregularities were reported. Masked gunmen directly oversaw polls, voters casting several ballots was common, and Ukrainian police seized 100,000 pre-completed, yes, ballots from armed separatists outside Slavyansk. Putin said that he respected the will of the voters, even as the Kremlin called for negotiations. The EU responded by expanding its sanctions against Russian individuals and companies. In the east, fighting between separatist militias and government forces continued, while the rest of the country prepared for May 25's presidential election. Despite a significant reduction in polling station activity in Luhansk and Donetsk going to pro-Russian militants seizing control of voting stations and ballot boxes, turnout throughout Ukraine was high. Petro Poroshenko, an Ukrainian businessman and politician, won in a landslide, easily surpassing the 50% threshold required to win in the first round of voting. Timoshenko placed second with 13% of the vote. Candidates from Svoboda and the right sector parties received less than 1%. On the ground, intense fighting resumed in eastern Ukraine following the election. Dozens of pro-Russian separatists were killed in a battle for Donetsk's international airport, and a Ukrainian military helicopter was shot down outside Slavyansk, killing all 14 people on board. On June 7, Petro Poroshenko was sworn in as Ukraine's president. He immediately provided a plan to bring peace to rebel-held areas, but the conflict persisted and Russia was again charged with actively supporting the separatists after three unidentified Soviet-era tanks appeared in Ukrainian cities near the Russian border. On June 14, one day after the Ukrainian army reclaimed the city of Mariupol, rebels shot down a transport plane carrying 49 people as it attempted to land in Luhansk. This caused Poroshenko to call a halt to military operations in the east, offering a temporary truce, as well as amnesty to separatists who were willing to lay down their arms. The new campaign was launched in late June, and the Ukrainian president had a 60-minute phone conversation with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Kuchma was dispatched to negotiate with rebel leaders, who indicated their readiness to accept the proposed ceasefire. Putin cited his desire to assist in the normalization of eastern Ukraine's situation as a reason for rescinding an order, issued before Crimea's annexation, that allowed Russian troops on Ukrainian soil. On June 27, after prolonged Russian objections, Poroshenko signed a long-delayed EU association agreement, promising closer cooperation with Europe. The Ukrainian military recaptured the cities of Slavyansk and Kramatorsk in the following weeks, which suggests that government forces are making significant progress against the rebels. Separatist militias, on the other hand, began to use increasingly sophisticated weaponry systems, and at least 19 Ukrainian soldiers were killed and hundreds were wounded during one attack in eastern Ukraine when their position was hit by a rocket artillery barrage. As the Ukrainian military became more aggressive with its use of attack aircraft, pro-Russian forces responded by intensifying their air defense campaign. On July 14 a Ukrainian transport plane was shot down at an altitude of more than 20,000 feet or 6,000 meters, much higher than the range of the portable air defense systems that separatists had been using. On July 16, a Ukrainian fighter jet was shot down over the Donetsk region. Ukrainian officials said that the Russian military was behind both attacks. The civilian death toll from the conflict increased dramatically on July 17 when a Malaysia Airlines 777 carrying 298 people crashed in the Donetsk region. Ukrainian and pro-Russian forces quickly denied responsibility for any role in the downing of the jet, which US intelligence analysts later confirmed was brought down by a surface-to-air missile. Investigators and recovery workers were not able to do their job properly because of the pro-Russian forces who were in control of the crash site. It took many days before most of the bodies could be collected. As international attention focused on the crash, the government in Kyiv stopped working. Svoboda and UDAR withdrew their support from the ruling coalition, and Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk resigned because he was frustrated at how slowly laws were being passed. Parliament ultimately decided not to accept Yatsenyuk's resignation after agreeing to his proposed budget amendments. 
but Poroshenko decided to call for early elections to be held in October 2014. The Ukrainian military continued to advance on the separatist strongholds of Donetsk and Luhansk in the east. Although Russia continues to deny involvement in the fighting, Moscow acknowledged in August that a platoon of Russian paratroopers had been detained while on Ukrainian soil. After Ukrainian authorities released video interviews with the captives, Russian military officials said they had inadvertently strayed across the border due to human error. Ukrainian government troops suffered a significant reversal of fortunes in late August, when rebel forces launched a new front in the south, capturing Novozovsk and threatening the vital port of Mariupol. Poroshenko said that Russian forces had entered Ukraine. NATO analysts estimated that more than 1,000 Russian troops were participating in the conflict. On September 5, the authorities of Ukraine and Russia met with separatist leaders in Minsk, Belarus, and agreed to a ceasefire that halted, but did not entirely stop, the bloodshed. With an eye on the future, Poroshenko proposed a series of political and economic reforms that were designed to prepare Ukraine to apply for EU membership in 2020. Poroshenko's mandate received approval from voters on October 26, when pro-Western parties triumphed in snap parliamentary elections. On November 2, separatists conducted local polls in Donetsk and Luhansk despite the Minsk ceasefire agreement. Ukrainian and Western authorities decried the results, which unsurprisingly went to separatist candidates. Despite Russia's initial promise to accept the elections, it later backtracked, stating that it would respect them instead. Poroshenko vowed to withdraw from a deal that would have granted greater autonomy to Donetsk and Luhansk as a result of this action. Fighting had deteriorated to previous levels by the end of the year. According to the United Nations, more than 5,000 people had been killed since the start of fighting. By that time, both parties had largely disregarded the ceasefire agreement. Although the Russian economy had been weakened by a combination of Western sanctions and plummeting oil prices, advanced Russian military gadgets continued to be seen in eastern Ukraine as a separatist offensive pushed back government troops. Rebels seized the fiercely contested Donetsk airport, just a shell after months of intense combat, in late January, and they stepped up efforts to capture Debaltseva, which is held by the government. Hundreds were killed in the military campaign's bombardment of residential areas, including at least 30 in a separatist rocket attack on Mariupol, and world leaders urged for a peaceful solution to the conflict. On February 12, 2015, Ukraine, Russia, France, and Germany's heads of state signed an agreement to end the conflict and withdraw heavy weapons. The tenuous peace held, and heavy weapons were withdrawn by both sides in early September 2015. Despite numerous breaches of the ceasefire, over 9,000 people were killed and more than 20,000 wounded by the end of the year. According to Russian human rights organizations, more than 2,000 Russian troops have been killed since the outbreak of conflict in April 2014. Russian authorities continued to deny any involvement in the war, and Putin signed a bill limiting public access to information about the deaths of Russian soldiers during special operations in May 2015. As the situation in eastern Ukraine remained frozen, Ukrainians grew weary of the rate at which political and economic reform occurred. Although the Poroshenko government had claimed to be committed to transparency and rooting out endemic corruption, it could point to few genuine accomplishments. In May 2015, Poroshenko appointed former Georgian president Mikhail Saakashvili as governor of the Odessa region, but Saakashvili ran into opposition from Kyiv right away. In February 2016, Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk narrowly survived a no-confidence motion, and he resigned in April. In May 2017, when Poroshenko was running for president once again, the Ukrainian government published two volumes of his tax returns from 2000 all the way to 2007. The revelation that Groisman had used offshore tax shelters during his presidency sparked criticism from opposition lawmakers. A wealth of documents stolen from a Panamanian legal firm exposed a criminal conspiracy of breathtaking scale, implicating numerous prominent figures and politicians from across the world. Poroshenko said he had done nothing wrong and that he had complied with all applicable laws. Poroshenko's popularity rating plummeted into single digits ahead of the 2019 presidential election, but two events in late 2018 boosted it. In November 2018, Russian naval ships opened fire on Ukrainian vessels and captured both the ships and their crews in the Kerch Strait. Poroshenko announced martial law in 10 regions, the first time this had been done since Ukraine's independence from the Soviet Union. The United Nations was contacted, and the General Assembly voted in favor of a resolution calling on Russia to withdraw its troops from Crimea and end its occupation of Ukrainian territory. Despite the UN resolution, Russia continued to increase its military presence in Crimea, but the confrontation appeared to validate Poroshenko's re-election campaign slogan, Army, Language, and Faith. Poroshenko's third pillar would be the focus of his major pre-election policy initiative, namely, the establishment of an independent Ukrainian Orthodox Church. The Moscow Patriarchate had controlled the Ukrainian Orthodox Churches since the 17th century, but in December 2018 President Poroshenko and church officials announced a split from Russia. 
In January 2019, Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew I formally granted autocephaly to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. By this time, the Russian Orthodox Church had cut ties with Constantinople and the Ecumenical Patriarchate in response. Despite Poroshenko's efforts to steer the public conversation, voter dissatisfaction with official corruption and the economy remained high. The 2018 presidential election in Ukraine featured a number of firsts. For the first time, a candidate was selected by lottery. For the second time in history, an incumbent president was defeated by opposition leader Yulia Tymoshenko at the polls. The race appeared to be a rerun of 2014's contest between Poroshenko and Tymoshenko, but television personality and political novice Volodymyr Zelensky shattered the status quo. Zelensky had played the role of Ukraine's president in a popular sitcom. He used his huge online presence as a weapon against official corruption to run for office for the first time. In the first round of voting on March 31, 2019, Zelensky took 30% of the vote while Poroshenko came second with 16%. The second round took place April 21, and Zelensky crushed his opponent in a landslide, taking more than 73% of the vote. On June 22, Poroshenko announced that he would not run for re-election in 2021, but would instead launch a second presidential bid after his first term. During his concession speech, the president said his political career was not yet over, while Zelensky promised that as president, his first goal would be to achieve permanent peace in war-torn eastern Ukraine. On May 20, 2019 the day of Zelensky's inauguration, parliament was dissolved and snap legislative elections were called. Zelensky's Servant of the People Party won an outright parliamentary majority in the July 21 voting. President-elect Volodymyr Zelensky's legitimacy was confirmed when the Vakovna Rada voted to ratify it, allowing him to push for a peace agreement that would see Ukrainian troops and Kremlin-backed insurgents withdraw from the so-called contact line in eastern Ukraine. Zelensky's critics labeled his decision a surrender that would do nothing but legitimize Russian aggression in the Donetsk Basin and Crimea, but he retained significant backing from a war-weary population. As Ukraine's president, Zelensky tried to keep his new government focused on the country's international and domestic problems, but he was quickly dragged into a political controversy in the United States. The United States had committed $400 million in military assistance to Ukraine, but U.S. President Donald Trump put a halt on the money before speaking with Zelensky on July 25, 2019. Trump urged Zelensky to investigate the son of a political opponent, Joe Biden, who had served on the board of one of Ukraine's major natural gas companies during their conversation. The military supplies were finally delivered more than a month later, but by then congressional Democrats were investigating Trump's alleged attempt to pressure Ukraine. On September 25, 2019, the House Judiciary Committee launched an inquiry into whether Trump had committed obstruction of justice by firing Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein in July 2018. That investigation served as the basis for a congressional impeachment inquiry against Trump that was started on September 24, 2019. The U.S. Senate voted to acquit Trump of the charges against him. Trump fired several officials who he felt were not loyal enough to him, including the National Security Council's top Ukraine expert and the United States ambassador to Ukraine. The pandemic disrupted life in Ukraine beginning in 2020. The Ukrainian economy was hit hard, with lockdowns and the closure of non-essential businesses. The situation was especially severe in the Donbas, where infrastructure damage caused by the Russian-backed insurgency resulted in significant water supply disruptions. Zelensky's national COVID-19 mitigation strategy, which stood him opposed with some local politicians seeking to assert their independence under 2014 government decentralization reforms, would have a big influence on local elections in October 2020. Mayoral races in different parts of the country had different outcomes. The national parties, including Zelensky's servant of the people, did not do as well as local parties. This also reflects a decline in Zelensky's approval from the public. Zelensky had difficulty making progress on the populist reforms that got him elected. The conflict in the Donbas region continued without resolution. However, Zelensky was eventually able to pass a law limiting the influence of oligarchs. This law did not resolve the conflict, however. In fact, the situation in the Donbas soon became the biggest threat to regional stability since the end of the Cold War. Starting in October 2021, Russia began to massively increase the number of troops and military equipment near its border with Ukraine. Additional forces were sent to Belarus, the Russian-backed separatist enclave of Transnistria in Moldova, and Russian-occupied Crimea over the following months. In February 2022, Western military analysts predicted that as many as 190,000 Russian troops were surrounding Ukraine, warning that an invasion was imminent. Putin dismissed the allegations, claiming that a planned build-up of the Russian navy in the Black Sea was nothing new. While Western leaders talked to both Zelensky and Putin to try and stop a Russian invasion, Putin made some demands. These demands would give him veto power over NATO expansion, and stop NATO forces from going to any countries that were members before 1997. 
This would take away the NATO security umbrella from Eastern and Southern Europe as well as the Baltics. These proposals were rejected. Putin recognized the independence of the self-proclaimed People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk on February 21, 2022. Russian troops went into Ukrainian territory as peacekeepers, and Russian military activity in the Donbas became open. Western leaders responded to Russia's actions in Ukraine by imposing sanctions on Russian financial institutions. On February 24, Zelensky delivered an impassioned plea for peace on Russian television but also vowed that Ukraine would defend itself. Later that day, at 6 a.m. on February 24, 2022, President Vladimir Putin went on Russian television to announce the start of a special military operation. Explosions could be heard throughout Ukraine minutes later, and sirens began to wail in Kyiv. Leaders around the world condemned Russia's unprovoked invasion, promising swift and severe economic penalties.